I would love to call upon Dr. Piti uh, Kulkari sir to felicitate Dr. Vipo uh, Bodra sir. I would like to call upon Dr. Sate sir to felicitate uh, Dr. Vishnu Viratha sir. Sir, 
not only in pediatrics but also in share markets and swimming also. And uh, uh, one thing I want to convey that keep learning like sir and have a wonderful learning experience today. As CMB unfolds, we get more and more knowledge. Thank you, sir. <laughs> that uh, age is not hard to learn new things and sir is, the, uh, is giving us the same lessons that we have to learn every day each and new things. Uh, I would like to uh, Dr. Kakeva sir to say a few things uh, about you. Let's speak. Initially, I would like to thank the director of the Sumatra branch for attending this meeting. Initially, I realized in as well in 2001, or 2001 or 2001, after Pretty Company was a president. At that time, this activity was started. And because of him, this activity is being continued every year. The idea is that, see, such eminent speakers and workers in graphic do not come to Sarapur so easily or we cannot attend them so often. So at least once a year we will be able to take the advantage of their experience and knowledge. And as you know, the genetic knowledge is advancing by lips and bounds. And we in our practice daily, we cannot keep pace with the advances that offer. And my question is to at least introduce these advances that are offering to our patients in this area. I suppose we have been fairly successful for, for this last 23 years. This is 23rd this day, uh, CME. And on different topics, we have been gathering every year. And I am really thankful to the IAP Sulapur branch and the, all the presidents who have worked with us to further this activity. As you know, Sarat expired in a car accident suddenly when visiting Lato for going to Fatima. And uh, he was deeply interested in your order. I had sent him to Kerala to work at the Raju in the ventilator management. And if you see, in the initial two, three years, we had this CME on ventilation and neonatology. So that was the beginning. Since then, many other topics have been called like uh, cardiology, neurology, pathology also has been found once, and uh, uh, emergency management, pediatric surgical aspects. And I, along with the help of Dr. Vijay Patil, who has worked with me for the last uh, 40 years, we have been continuing on this activity. And I am really, really thankful to the members of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics for continuing to back this activity. And uh, uh, Dr. Kunda, I am very thankful to you for talking so good words about me. As you know, I, I, I have a very, I have got a very ignorant nature. I get angry very soon. So, in spite of that, he has got so much love and affection to me. And we thank all the speakers who have been very nice to accept our invitation and come to this CME. Thank you. The topics covered till now was in 2001 to 2005, it was neonatal ventilation, where uh, Dr. Raju, uh, the teacher of Shadar Tasla, uh, came uh, for this CME. Then Dr. Girish Gupta, Mesh Mathen, AM team came. Uh, then epilepsy CME was conducted by Dr. Sonu Udani, uh, Dr. Preeti Joshi. Then pediatric emergency was uh, conducted by Sun Dr. Santosh Shor. Uh, so he was the IP president at that time, and Dr. Amdesh Srivastava. Uh, 
cardio was the same, it was conducted in 2014, which was uh, conducted by Dr. Snail Kulkarni and Dr. Vinay Goshi. Then pediatric EPFC uh, CME was conducted by Dr. Ramesh Kunti, Dr. Vilas Zadu, Dr. Lokes Lidamba. And Palmanova EPFC was also conducted by Dr. Subramanian. Uh, then uh, pediatric rounds by Dr. Amdekan and team have been conducted uh, in 2017. And uh, in 2019, we have again covered neonatal advanced ventilation and updates by Dr. Sachin Shah, Jason said. And in 2020, we have covered uh, hematology uh, with Dr. Nitin Shah and Dr. Nehman. And last year, it was a central nervous system by Rainbow Team, Dr. Lotus in the pan uh, uh, team. And this year, we are covering uh, pediatric hepatology. Thank you, sir. For giving us a chance to learn and uh, update ourselves with newer advances by conducting such things. Thank you, Pastor Also. Uh, now, moving on with uh, Dr. CMB, we'll start with the first session. Children's Hospital, uh, UK, in 1995, training in pediatric gastroenterology at uh, uh, Brittingham Children's Hospital in uh, 1997. Also, has special interest in vaccinology and biostatistics. He has some awards uh, on his name. He is awarded with the uh, Dr. James Fleck uh, Endowment Award. Uh, he has got a gold medal for the best paper twice in the year 1994 and 96. Awarded the best paper award in pathology for molecular studies in pediatric person disease in India. There are innumerable publications as well as uh, reviews in various national and international journals, many contributions in various books. He is an ex-member of WHO First Development for Vaccine Advisory Committee, member of the Global Burden of Disease in uh, India, uh, Maternal and Child Health Expert Group, then he is an editor uh, uh, editorial board, Scientific World uh, Journal, past chairperson as well as past secretary of Pediatric Gastroenterology chapter, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, and former member of Society for Natural Effects of Health in Adults, member of various task force of uh, uh, Indian Academy of uh, Pediatrics on Gastroenterology topic, uh, Department of Biotechnology Expert Group on Vaccine Research and Development 2018. And ICMR Childhood uh, Anima Task Force 2018. So, we'll start with the first uh, session. Indian Child of Cirrhosis, 
there is some recent, not very recent, but recent updates with the role of the that is coming up. And I will talk to you a little bit about ICC and what try to look into ICC. And then, of course, go on to the second most common copper related issue that is Wilson species. So, for people in the past, they know this, but for the young friends, I'm not too sure you have seen child ICC for a long time. So, let me just remind you that there was a disease called as ICC which used to happen. It was, in fact, in the early 70s, the fifth common cause of under child mortality in India. Watch would be full of these cases. And it would occur in children between 6 months to 5 years of age. It had a primary male predominance. It was familiar, but there was no definite inheritance pattern. The typical features were that it used to occur in a Hindu community, a middle income group, and once diagnosed, it was universally <coughs> Then the work by my mentors and seniors in hospital, Dr. Anand Pandit, Dr. Sheila Ave, and of course the collaboration with Professor Stuart Tanner of Sheffield Children's Hospital. They did biopsies in these various conditions and along with that, of course, ICC, and they found that the copper content was extremely <coughs> It really came out, they started staining the liver biopsy with porcine stain. The reason why they started staining the liver biopsy for us is what the Lawson stains hepatitis B. And one of the postulated mechanisms of ICC in those days was is it related to hepatitis B? So in trying to stain for hepatitis B, the Lawson stain something else, and that was copper. And that put people to thinking, oh, that's copper. But is it copper or is it stain something else? And then hepatic copper estimation started. And as you can see over here, ICC had a very high amount of hepatic copper. The next question was, where is this copper coming from? The copper is primarily coming from brass vessels, copper vessels, which used to be used for storing and especially boiling milk. And this is what babies <coughs> and children at that particular age, six months to two years, of the break. Experiment studies were done of boiling, storing milk in glass vessels, copper vessels, aluminium vessels and as you can see over here the copper content is went up almost 100 times if you were to heat milk in copper and glass vessels and this was what the children were drinking. So the mechanisms which were thought of that time was that a child who has insufficient breast milk is on a top plate and is using brass and copper would get ISIS. But that could not explain why all children were not getting ISIS who were being put on brass and copper vessels. And so there was at that time a postulate mechanism that okay, increased hepatic copper is necessary, but it requires something else, a predisposition. And no one knew, and we still don't really know what that predisposition was. Various things were looked in, was there an underlying hepatitis, was there an immune complex of normalities? was there some other toxins and all of them looked and thrown by the wayside because nothing of this could be done. And then it was thought okay maybe you have a genetic predisposition. <coughs> Remember this was 1970s and 80s where genetics was in its really infancy in terms of liver disease. So it was always thought that okay there could be some underlying genetic problem which could cause that. While interest in ICD started growing <coughs> In the Tyrol region of Austria, cases exactly similar to ICC were getting this plan. They occurred a long time back. They were occurred actually between 1900 to 1974. But a group of father and son, Mullers, they published many articles of this thing called en en endemic Tyrol infantile cirrhosis. It was clinically, pathologically very, very similar to ICC when we did the biopsies and we did the biopsies from their patients and our patients, we got down. It was exactly the same. You couldn't make out whether this ICC or with this PKS. And they also had high, when they retrospectively checked in their high amount of copper and they also had a So it was not Indian only alone. There was a country outside that was showing this. Then also spray reports started coming from the US, from Japan, from Australia of similar conditions with similar biopsies and similar findings which is called as idiopathic copper toxicosis. Not many cases, stray reports, around 30 cases described 
In the majority of them, there was proper history, but not necessarily in all. So we had all these sort of groups of disorders from India and out of India. And the question came around was, let us now look for the genetics. Now that genetics has gone up so much, we know that there are a lot of possibilities in genetics. And the questions were two or three things. First was, when Wilson's gene was described, is ICC a type of a variant of Wilson's? Let's talk. Is it a variant? Is it a different presentation of Wilson's disease, etc.? There are a lot of copper transport proteins which have also been described, which have been shown here. So, is it related to that? So, that's the first part. Second, there are human <coughs> the models where you get a copper paroxyphosis like condition. Let us look into that and find out because now genes are getting picked up on each and every condition. And finally, do a genome wide search in the patients and the family because we have ICC survivors who are off penicillin and they are in their 40s and 50s now. They are doing well, but they are there. Blood samples are there. The DNA is there. So, multiple studies showed that ICC and Wilson disease has nothing to do with each other. There is no haplotypic sharing, there is no associated studies, so no EPDC. So, that hypothesis was kept aside. Other genetic studies of copper transport proteins also showed in patients with Wilson, in ICC that they did not have the gene which was responsible for many of the copper transport proteins. In dog, there is a very similar disease which occurs in a group of dogs which is called the meddling bacteria which is exactly similar to ICC. And the gene for this in dogs was picked up and the equivalent gene in humans was also identified. So the question was is it similar to that? So that gene was looked into in our patients of ICC as well as in outside countries and again it was not right. And finally a genome wide search really looking in the survivors of cirrhosis patients and uh, some of the patients were looked into again to find out. And unfortunately or fortunately, till date, there is no evidence of genetic. <coughs> so really, I still don't have an answer. What is that query which we have got why those children develop ISIS? With whatever genetics tests that have been done so far, and these have been done over the last 15, 20 years, we don't have an underlying genetic explanation. So, with the dying ICC, we may or may not be able to answer this question anymore. But if it comes out, it is something that will be very useful. So, now from this disorder, let's go on to the disorder that we are now seeing so common. Parkinson's <coughs> disease is not very uncommon. It's thought to be 1 in 30,000 to 50,000. But most recent data say it's as common as 1 in 18,000 across the world. So, that's not a very uncommon disorder. We know it's because of copper deposition in various tissues. We have identified the gene. As pediatricians, <coughs> most children would come to us between the ages of around four or five years onwards. And most of them would be hepatic presentation. Why do you get this disease to make it very, very simple? Normally, copper is there in almost every food product that we have. In normal individuals, the copper from normal diet is absorbed from the intestine, goes into the portal circulation, goes into the liver. The liver uses this copper for various enzymes. It's absolutely important for things like cytotoxicity, etc. If you don't have copper, you will not survive. Excess amount of copper that is not required is actually excreted. It's excreted out into the bile, it goes down into the intestine and goes out. Some copper is then bound to celluloplasmin, and celluloplasmin takes the copper into the various other organs in the body because copper is deposited there in other organs also. When we have a defect in the ATP7B gene, which is now the gene which has been associated with Wilson's disease, you have a problem of two ends. One problem is this copper cannot be excreted into the body or into the intestine, and there is defective uh, absorption of this copper. Into or incorporation of this copper into celluloplasm. So, obviously, you can understand copper cannot come out one way, copper cannot go into the celluloplasm, blood tissue, so copper remains in the liver and then it causes toxicity. <coughs> that is the simplest way by which you get Wilson's disease. Liver and brain are the commonest hit organs of copper <coughs> and Wilson's disease. But we need to remember it can affect kidneys, it can affect the heart. It can affect the bone, 
and other systems also. They are uncommon, but they can be there either along with liver and CNS involvement or sometimes even isolated. And that's why you get a very wide presentation. Coming to the presentations, any liver presentation can be with success. Acute hepatitis is not getting better. Acute liver failure, chronic liver disease with decompensation. All of them can be with symptoms. Asymptomatic child with transaminitis, you have done LFTs for some other reason or you have done a workup for something else and you have found the highest GPT. Asymptomatic hepatomegaly or hepatospital megaly, new child has come to you in a clinic and you just all of these can be presentations of with some disease. And so <laughs> it really is extremely important that you start thinking about it. For instance, in any patient of the environment after the age of 3 4 years, it rarely or almost never present before that. Please don't start setting tests for Wilson disease in 6 month old and 1 year old children. That's not Wilson's. Neurological disorders, in the Western books will describe it comes after 12, 13, 14 years, but in India we have seen quite commonly in children even of 8, 9, and 10 years old. And the common ones that you will see is speech problems, and the child was otherwise speaking well, drooling. So dysarthria is the commonest. It is also the least likely to respond to treatment and make it the longest to respond to the treatment. So it remains with the person in the individual for a very long time. So dysarthria, drooling, tremors and dystonia if advanced and not diagnosed in time, gate risk, all of these are but they will come after the age of 7, 8 or 9 years. Usually the neuropsychiatric are along with the neurological and they can sometimes even precede the neurological. They usually occur at the age of 10 to 20 years. Scholastic backwardness, mood swings, depressive behaviors, all of those conditions we so called associate with adolescents or teenagers. And quite often these presentations are missed or not given an importance by either the family or the pediatrician saying that oh he's in that age he's going to behave like that but that's where there is a delay in the diagnosis so you need to not only ask the history but you need to do a little bit of clinical examination and pick up certain neurological signs that are there and if you suspect that this is not really behaving like a typical adolescent problem, please go ahead and investigate. Because the longer you take time to diagnose the neurological Wilson's or hepatic Wilson's for that matter, the more likely the person is going to be left with that particular disorder for the rest of his life. Remember, cognition is not compared to that extent. That is something that is very important for you. <laughs> the less common is are hemolysis and renal hemolysis. Hemolysis can come to you with acute hemolysis. You can get a child with recurrent hemolysis. So the child has had hemolytic disorder three years back, two years back, one year back, and some of them have in fact been referred to us even for the hematologists because they worked up for all other causes of hematologic abnormalities. And finally, it has turned out to be real sense. Or it could be a chronic low grade hemolysis going on for a long period of time. You will pick it up usually associated with some other deliver disorder, which is <coughs> And of course, renal tubular involvement. Very common, they will present you to you with bony abnormalities, a child with knock knees, a child has difficulty of walking because of that, with a hepatomegaly or hepatosuclonegaly. Renal tubular abnormalities are very common. They may be occurred to start with, and unless you look for the renal tubular abnormalities, you will miss them. Now, in every patient of insulin, whether it's hepatic or neurological, we investigate to find out if there is some other thing that is wrong. Because that requires a separate drug treatment besides your standard drugs that you are going to use. A lot of investigations are there. Commonest one usually is ceruloplasmy, but none of these are very 100% diagnostic. You will have children of Wilson disease with a normal cellular plasma, and you will have patients who don't have Wilson disease with a cellular plasma in 15 or 20. The lower the cellular plasma, the more likely your child has Wilson. So, a child has cellular plasma less than 5, you are, and of course, with a liver disease, you are almost certain that this is Wilson. You will require other parameters to support it. 
So, cellular plasmin of 2, 3, 4 usually is absorption resistance. The cellular plasmin of 10 to 20, <coughs> you need to be very careful because there are a lot of other disorders where you have that sort of cellular plasmin. So, it's low but not enough for you to get the diagnosis based on that. Urethane copper 100 used to be the cutoff. Recent evidence now suggests that we have a very accurate measuring system. Anything more than 40 is also enough to say it is possible. We still prefer the term 100. Hepatic copper, we used to do it. Here we have stopped doing it for a long time, primarily because of the fact that we have not been able to identify a very good center that accurately and reliably measures hepatic copper. And with the advent of genetics, the role of hepatic copper has gone down. <laughs> There are many mutations. Now that close to around a thousand mutations associated with Wilson's disease. You cannot get a specifically targeted mutation in a diagnosis because mutations north, south, east are completely different. So if at all you are going to make a genetic diagnosis of Wilson's disease, you have to go across all the exomes, you need a whole exome. And along with that, because whole exome may not always pick up the large deletions and the duplications, you will need to go advanced <coughs> But remember, when you send a genetic test for Wilson's disease, if it is positive and they have picked up a mutation that has been associated with Wilson's disease, you have a diagnosis. But if it is not there, or it is there on only one element, remember, you have, you have to have two mutations, on both the elements, you have to have Wilson's disease. So you may get a report saying that it's not there, it's only there on one. You have to be very, very careful. Because the absence of picking up mutation, even if you do a whole exome and MLP, it does not rule out Wilson's disease. So you have to interpret the genetic test very, very carefully. Even in the best of centers in the world, where they are doing the most advanced genetic tests, even in that center, the genetic tests have come negative in almost 10 to 12 percent of cases. And we don't do the really extensive genetic. We do a reasonably good job. In our situation, we would pick up nearly 25. So, negative genetic test does not rule out. That's something that's very, very important. At least today, more advanced is coming out, we may be able to pick up 100%, but today we can. Because there are a lot of tests and none of them are accurate, there are various scores. There is a Lipsic score and a modified Lipsic score. Modified Lipsic score is from the publication which we have from India. It basically gives marks that your cellular plasma, your urinary copper, your KF ring, your clinical presentation, if you do hepatic copper, MRI findings, etc. A score then more or equal to 4, this is a published article, you can find it anywhere, is a diagnosis of Wilson disease. A score less than 4, you will require some more studies or you will have to look at some more. Follow this child up a little more to ensure whether something else is coming up. So this is the source <coughs> for making the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. In terms of the management, there are many guidelines. We have the SGAN guidelines, we have the ESL, European Association for Study of Liver Guidelines. The third one is the Indian guideline, which is a group of a group of doctors, pediatricians, so the SGAN. The Movement Disorders Society, the Adult Liver Disease Society got together and came out with this guideline in 2019. And the most recent is the ASL, AL, American Association Study of Liver Disease, AASLD, 2022 guidelines. They are very similar, a little bit of difference here. So I'm not going to talk to you about guidelines now. I'm going to talk to you about what we do and what we believe. So, low copper role, very minimal. Only we ensure or try to ensure that they have a low copper diet for the first year or two of treatment after diagnosis. After that, we are not so worried about it unless the patient has been effectively decoppered and is taking medication. We have to ensure that they avoid the high copper. So we don't give a very strict diet. We avoid chocolates, very important for children, because high copper. Dry fruits, nuts. Shellfish, mushrooms, commonest things that most of the people do. We 
care to tell the police that's something that you should be very careful. But again, it's only for the first year or two. After that, you allow a little bit of leeway to that. So here the treatment is medications. Two chelators we have at present, penicillamine and triantine, and we have zinc, which is not a chelator. The aim of therapy is you have to reduce the copper to a subtoxic threshold because they have a high body copper all over. And after it is reduced, you have to maintain it because if you stop the medication, the copper will come up again to the food that we are not eating. So for reducing the copper, it's the chelators, either penicillamine or triantine. For maintenance therapy, you could use the same two, or in this situation, you can also add zinc. Of DP and triantine are chelators. Penicillin is most easily available in India. It is the cheapest. It has a lot of side effects. <coughs> one in four or one in five patients may actually need to stop penicillin therapy because of the side effects of it. In contrast to that, triantine is more expensive, but the side effects are very, very few. Initially, this was not available in the country. Now it's available. There are two companies that make it. What do we do? We prefer penicillin still because they are the most affordable. We monitor our patient very carefully. But in some situations, like if you put a patient on penicillin and he started developing side effects and hypersensitivity is the most important problem with penicillin, then we start trying to. Or patient has got very severe thrombocytopenia. I am talking about levels of 20, 30,000 even before starting. <coughs> That's the time you may think of it. Trying to give the way to go. Or there is significant weight in the body. Besides this, most of the patients we will start with penicillin in the first choice. Zinc is not a chelator, it induces metallothionine. Metallothionine is there in your liver, it binds copper, but more importantly, it is there in your intestine, it is there in your enterocyte. It is a protein. So, all the pop, what zinc does is induces more and more metallothionine into your enterocyte. The copper that we are taking through your diet. It goes into the enterocyte on its way to the portal circulation. Within the enterocyte, the metallothionine catches it and holds it. It holds it in the cell. It prevents it from going into the circulation. It remains in the cell. Every week, every two weeks, your intestinal cells are shut off and you excrete them in your stool. Along with the cell, the copper goes up. So that's how zinc acts. It acts by increasing the fecal excretion of while chelators like deep penicillin and trying to act by increasing the urinary excretion. So these are chelators that are not. You can use zinc along with penicillin to start a new patient with Wilson's disease. Some people do that, some people don't do that. There are no head to head studies to show that penicillin and zinc is better than penicillin alone. We use it very commonly for symptomatic or pre-symptomatic symptoms picked up because of sibling screening and of course our maintenance therapy. So in liver diseases, these are the common things patients are presenting and how you treat. So take an acute liver failure with n This child is going to require liver transplant. It has to be listed quickly, planned quickly, move ahead to a liver transplant. Till you start a liver liver transplant, you can start this child on chelators and zinc together because this is a severe form of the disease. You have to give whatever you can. So you give penicillin, you give zinc. You start all other mechanisms like bridge therapy, like plasma exchange, plasma paralysis, mass, whatever you have with you. But this child will require a transplant. The second child is a child with acute liver failure. So he has coagulopathy. We now know that acute liver failure is not defined with encephalopathy. You need not have encephalopathy for acute liver failure. It's based on your ion. So you can get a child with acute liver failure, but there is no encephalopathy when he comes to you. What you do in that situation? You ideally calculate the new Wilson index. That is an index which is based again by your scores, which are given to bilirubin, ion, AST, albumin, etc. If the score is less than 11, you try to continue and manage with your medical therapy. If the score is more than or equal to 11, very likely this child will require a liver transplant. You start planning for that and put this patient 
for again your cumulators plus C. Not necessarily all those which score more than or equal to 11 will require a transfer. With your therapy, with your other supporting measures, some of them may even come out and be not requiring a transfer. So, in this situation, the score more than 11 makes you plan, makes you prepare that a transplant is necessary. But please continue medical therapy. There are innumerable children the score of more than or equal to 11 who have not required a liver transplant if they have started aggressively treating them and they have been The regular child that comes to you with a typical chronic liver disease, etc., you start treating with chelator. And some people use with it, some people don't use it. The choice is really yours. There are no guidelines which say one way or the other. We used to use chelators and zinc together, but you have to remember if you are using penicillamine and zinc, penicillamine has to be given on an empty stomach, zinc has to be given on an empty stomach. If you don't give this medicine on an empty stomach, 50% of the medicine just comes out as it is. On top of that, penicillamine and zinc have to be given 5 or 6 hours apart. So if you are giving 2-3 doses of penicillamine, 2 doses of zinc, on an empty stomach and keeping 5-6 hours apart, it's a problem for the family to give their medicine. Compliance is going to be miserable. So we say, okay, forget the zinc for this state, let's just concentrate on penicillin because at this stage that is the most important. But if you want to give penicillin to of that, that's fine. <coughs> if you have a child who has been picked up because of asymptomatic transamines, either you give chelators of low dose, that is the maintenance dose, or you can start with zinc. Because there is an active disease, he may be asymptomatic, but he has got transamalite. So it's active asymptomatic. If you have an asymptomatic child who has been picked up because of sibling screening, but has got normal transamalite, again you could use both. I think zinc is a better way to go, safer, less side effects, cheaper, and they do wonderfully well with that as long as compliance is good. Now with genetics coming up, you can make a diagnosis antenatally. If the family wants, if they have one child with Wilson disease and the mother becomes pregnant again, or even at birth, you can <coughs> do a genetic test if you have picked up the mutation in the original child. So, if you have picked up a mutation in the original child in the first year or two years, it will not advocate starting zinc therapy because these children can then go on to develop proper deficiency. It will be required for the part. So, there are more universal guidelines, but most people who deal with Wilson disease will start zinc in children around the year for 15 years. If you have picked them up without diagnosis. And the dose is also slightly less. But remember once you have started this treatment, don't expect that everything is going to come to normal very soon. Especially your LFD. You will monitor them. It is important to ensure that the trend towards worsening stops and there is a trend towards improvement. Because as you can see from this paper by Dr. Thomas from King's College, it can take months or years for your LFTs to normalize after starting. Some have taken as long as two years, three years, four years, or even more than that. As long as your LFTs are improving, clinically the child is doing better, you are on the right track. So don't expect absolute normalization. You get it? Very good. Transplant is the way when your medical therapy doesn't work. So you can do a transplant in the Wilson disease setting for acute liver failure or for a decompensated child who is not responding to The biggest controversy going on in the world today in the last few years, do you do a liver transplant or a person with isolated neurological and this is a big discovery and I will spend some time on that because this is interesting. There have been reports in the past, stay reports, one patient here, one patient there, who have after a transplant, so that actually for a liver related problem. But those two people have got liver as well as neurological involved. Liver started failing, they did a transplant, liver got better as expected. But to this surprise they found the neurological problem also got better. It was very unusual. And some of them had severe neurological problems. <coughs> Even they started showing this. And these were spare reports here and there. Then came reports, some people started doing this transplant for neurological disorders much more common, especially to people from your French to 
then there came a period that some group thought that if you do a transplant in neurological distress disease, <coughs> your survival is lower. So you have more of a mortality. Again, some people stop doing transplant. Recent studies have shown that that is not necessarily so. Survival rates are the same whether you have neurological problems or you don't have neurological problems. We still don't have an answer to it. But very recent systematic review come out in 2022 where looked at liver transplant and neurological outcomes. And they looked at all the retrospective series, all the case reports and case series. And this included those where transplants were done for neurological condition alone, and also those were done for hepatic conditions in patients who have neurological problems. What did they show? 71 percent showed significant neurological improvement. And quite a few other other had got severe neurology. There were some of them who were totally bedridden for years together. No response to the treatment that they were uh, the teenagers. But after that, they had shown <coughs> MRIs which have changed after your transplant, MRI brains. <laughs> Survival has improved with recent studies. So, it's a big debate going on. None of the guidelines today suggest that you should do a transplant for neurological alone. The present guidelines suggest go and do the transplant for hepatic indications. <coughs> Irrespective of whether you have neurological problems or not. So, if you have mild, moderate, severe, go look at that. So, you were required to transplant, go ahead and do that. You may get improvement in the But this is a changing. As more and more series come out, this may be an indication for primary neurological problems alone. So, the last slide basically, where are we with this things today? I've been talking about this disease for the last 20, 25 years. And initially, my whole talk was around please recognize Wilson's disease. That's your very presentation. You may be missing it in the hepatic terminology. I still think we need to look into that. But a part of my now talk is a little bit that please don't over diagnose Wilson's disease because that is the problem that we are seeing now. We are getting children coming to our liver clinics because we have a Wilson disease clinic. Diagnosed as Wilson, I would put on penicillin for some time, but actually not having Wilson. They have been labeled as Wilson because celluloplasmy was 15, 16, urinary copper was normal, no KFB. So just from an isolated one single test, they have been labeled as Wilson. So we have no problems of awareness and we have no problems of poor diagnosis. Please be careful. Use the score. The score is there to help in situations before you make them. Once you label for Wilson's, the person is Wilson's for life. This treatment is forever. Remember about the very presentations I have talked to you about. We don't have a very good hepatic copper estimation, though it is the gold standard. But genetics, to some extent, has helped us in those confusing <coughs> cases where you are not very sure whether it is Wilson or not. And believe me, you rarely get a typical Wilson patient. You always have all these borderline reports and you're always scratching your head. Is this Wilson? Is this not Wilson? And those sort of things. The availability is now available. At least the two major medicines which are used across the world, penicillin and writing is now available to be made in India. And we really need to be sort of grateful. I mean, remember writing, I gave the cost of 10 to 15,000 now. Then these people who buy a tracking from abroad, it's still 30 to 40,000 rupees a month. It's almost unaffordable to buy. Now it's available. So if it has a problem, we can use it. And we do use it. Liver transplant, obviously, we make a little bit of that when we have a panel discussion. Remember about the molecular genetics. Means when you send a report, interpret the report appropriately, or take a help of a genetics to understand what that report implies. Otherwise, we will be on the wrong track. We really now need to concentrate on the rehabilitation of the hepatic, and more important than neurology. Because neurological requires not only medical diagnosis of trinitine or penicillin, but it requires so much to take care of the dystonia, take care of the speech therapy, take care of the involuntary movements. So, a neurologist with a social worker, with a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist, and a pathologist. Absolutely, the need of the day. Thank you all for your patience. <coughs> <coughs>
there are any questions? It is said that uh, your eyes will see if your mind knows. And sir, so, uh, as a pediatrician, will definitely uh, see if uh, in adolescent cases and if there are any neurological findings um, uh, to rule out of Wilson disease or any uh, uh, resistant in your skin, or uh, we'll uh, try to diagnose Wilson disease in early stages or refer uh, properly. Thank you for the elaborate uh, lecture on childhood copper disease. Um, uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Atas sir on stage. Dr. Atas sir is uh, chairman of Mapendia uh, Rupnade, Solapur. I would like to uh, ask Asliwal sir to felicitate him for providing the hall free of cost for this uh, <laughs> For this service, I am going to see him. And I am thankful to you. And I will also thank you. To call upon Dr. Vipur Rupert, sir. Dr. Popper, sir, he is the Director of Pediatric Hepatology and Gastroenterology, Center of Liver, Pancreas and Intestinal Transplant, uh, Naramati Max Super Specialty Hospital, Pile Pali <coughs> He has done his MBPS from GS uh, uh, Medical College and KM Hospital. He has done his MD Pediatrics from PGIMR uh, uh, Chandigarh and he has done his postgraduate uh, postgraduate uh, doctorate certificate course from Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute, Lucknow. And he's done uh, DM in pediatric gastroenterology from Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate uh, uh, Medical Center, Lucknow. He's the first uh, DM uh, in pediatric gastroenterology. He has many publications in uh, awards uh, on his names. Uh, he's a part of review articles and national guidelines, contributed chapters in books, received awards at various conferences, young investigator award. Uh, from European Society of uh, Pediatric Gastroenterology, Pathology and Nutrition, 2015, uh, Travel Award in GI Summer School Workshop uh, in 2014, and Travel Award in 2013. So I would like to talk. I would like to thank Solapur IP for giving us. Uh, uh, chance to interact with such a uh, lovely crowd over here. Uh, and after Dr. Vaudekas' uh, interesting talk, it was a very fluent journey in the history and now addressing the present problems that we are dealing with the proper uh, uh, diseases in the liver. Uh, so it was uh, wonderful to be here, sir. So I will start uh, my talk on the liver function test interpretation and what are the new investigations that we have in the liver disease. So you know that uh, when we are dealing with the liver disease, what we need to do is first to investigate the is that liver injury is present. Now. So we try to see the liver problem, we try to see the liver etiology and at what stage the liver disease is. Know that the liver disease, with the, uh, it's under the dynamic process. We start from hepatitis, injury progresses, we have a cirrhosis. Then there are different stages of the cirrhosis from compensation to decompensation, portal hypertension, ascites, and the problem. So we need to clinically see where we are uh, there. The uh, approach we need to see, they evaluate their biochemically, they by imaging, histopathology, newer uh, modalities, then genetic and molecular tests. So we need all integration of all these available modalities to arrive and approach a patient with the child with the liver disease. So liver has more than 500 functions that can be easily classified as synthetic disorders, excretory, uh, uh, synthetic excretory and metabolic uh, functions. So what are the liver function tests? We are actually not liver function tests. We are just seeing the biochemical injury. So there are injury tests. And what we need is a battery, a single test cannot identify us. So, so there is a battery of tests that gives us a different information. Okay. So, uh, so what does that this liver function test do? Is basically identify the liver injury. We try to classify them depending on the type of the liver injury. And then also we can see what the progression or the severity. And then once we know the diagnosis, we monitor the response to the treatment. 
But if the, if these tests do have certain limitations, one thing is that doesn't test at all the functional capacity. They just test few functions. Their back sensitivity and specificity and the interpretation should be always in the clinical context. Many a times on WhatsApp, we just get an LMP report from the patient and tell what the problem. That's not possible. You need to see the patient. We need to see the history. We need to examine, and then we will be able to come to a proper uh, diagnosis. So the LFT here basically what we do a standard liver function test that is basically we do a LFT, total quantity, then we do a uh, albumin and uh, protein, SGOT, SGBT, now ASK and ALT, and alkaline phosphatase and GDT, gamma glutarate transfer. So they have different different functions. So ASP, ALT tells us about the injury. Okay, so the cholestasis, uh, for cholestasis, we see increase in the alkaline phosphate and GDP cholestasis. And there is option to the flow and damage to the biliary system. For synthetic capacity, we see albumin and iron. For excretory function, bilirubin and sometimes uh, bile salts. And then metabolic function look for ammonia, sugar, and uh, sugar. Okay. So there are other tests we do not do that uh, often. So let's see how to interpret this liver function test. So uh, basically, we try to differentiate between the three patterns. One is hepatocellular injury, another is a cholestatic injury, and third is are dealing with an infiltrative disorder. So the, we use all these battery of tests that we have just discussed. So let's see a case and try to interpret this. So clinical history, most important always rural. So the seven years old boy who had a two days history of prolonged few and then his parents noticed there was yellow urine and sclera. And on examination, there was a hepato of maybe 3 centimeters. Spleen was not palpable, the sensory was normal. Then the liver function test we have ordered, this child has conjugated hyperbilirubin. So the direct or conjugated fraction was high. SGOT and SGPT both were elevated, that were more than 10 times. And alkaline phosphatase and GT were also elevated, but not to the extent as much AST and T elevated. So, uh, we know that okay, here we have more of an AST ALT elevation. So the so AST has sources a lot of other things apart from the liver and ALD is has a fewer sources of that product, but it, of course both can be elevated. So AST is mainly cleared more rapidly than ALD. So monitoring uh, uh, treatment response is better with AST. Now, the upper range has been revised for both boys and girls, is around uh, just uh, 25. So, this is to increase the sensitivity. So, that we pick up the liver disease at earlier stage and we do not wait. So that's the only function. But anyway, we have to do a severe liver function test to see what's going on. So, when your ALT and AST are more, so ALT is more than this, you will think of an acute injury. When you are ASK and ALT, ALT is more than ALT, you think of metabolic liver disease and sometimes viral infections or sometimes on the chronic liver diseases. Okay, so this uh, ratio is not very well studied in children. So once we have uh, basically disease, with, uh, once your LFT shows that your bilirubin is elevated, so we are thinking of uh, direct uh, hyperbilirubin. So I am not dealing with the neonatal cholestasis, I am going with the older age group, there will be a separate uh, session for that. So then we will think whether it is an acquired or uh, genetic diseases. Then most of the common is acquired because most other liver function tests are also. Uh, elevated. Then we we try to classify. I am dealing with the pathology which is inside the liver or outside the liver, and then if it is the intrahepatic, whether it is hepatocellular or cholestatic. So we will uh, further see with the help of a liver function test how to uh, reach this classification. Now we have this battery of test: ASTAT, alkaline phosphorus GGT, bilirubin, and then sensitive fringe function PT, INR, and LB. For example, we got a liver function test where SGOT and SGPT are much more elevated than the other fraction. So we know that this is because of the hepatocellular injury. Hepatocellular is dying and resulting in SGOT and SGPT. In this situation, the alkaline phosphorus GGP may be mildly elevated, bilirubin may or may not be elevated. And generally, uh, so with this, we will know that we have a cellular injury. So we are dealing with the hepatitis picture. If your INR is prolonged, which is even persists to be uh, increased even after vitamin K, then you are dealing with the sensitive function. Then we call it as a liver failure. Acute and chronic or depends on the uh, chronology of the symptoms. And when this albumin again is mixed, again tells you about the synthetic function and albumin is low, it's there for a significant duration. Because even if you can active in more than three weeks, you will get albumin as a well. low. So even in acute diseases also, you can get in a low albumin. Now, 
look at the second column. If you see the second column, the AST will be a mild rate and as, uh, uh, alkaline phosphate and SGT are very, uh, uh, they have increased to significantly higher than the upper limit of normal, below it may or may not be elevated. Here, once we do an INR, it's prolonged, but after giving vitamin K, it gets the character. So, this low uh, increased INR is because of low vitamin K, and here the synthetic function like albumin is normal. So, this kind of factor is with the uh, cholestasis. Uh, so, in hepatitis, we have a uh, few different diseases that we take care of. When you are getting a cholestatic disease, uh, we will come to uh, other cases when we see them. And in the third column, if you see, we will call it an infiltrative disease. They are less in number, but we need to identify this. Here, again, alkaline phosphorus GST is very high, but your bilirubin is generally will not be elevated. And here, then the BT ion is normal, albumin is normal. So, these we call it infiltrative diseases that we get like a tuberculosis of the uh, liver or uh, leukemia, which is involving the liver, or any other the Langerhans and histiocytosis. These are even the story diseases like Neiman, Peak, Gaucher's, where we are thinking of a infiltrative diseases. So, recognizing this pattern is important. In our clinical, uh, uh, clinically, most of us we see the first column. And then uh, the display is the hepatocellular injury. That are more commonly way to see. Now, if your enzymes are mildly elevated and your AST is more than ALD, then we think of like cirrhosis, Wilson disease, mitochondrial diseases, or uh, in adolescent, we can think of even the alcoholic. And also think of the non alcoholic diseases, like strenuous exercise. Sometimes adolescent, they, they go and hit the gym. So their AST LGs can be elevated. Myopathy is dystrophic. So we may even get them like two years, three years old kid with high AST, ALD. They are the sometimes the duches which are clinically still silent neurologically, but you can incidentally pick up the AST and derivation. Uh, hypothyroidism, but we screen a lot, so we rarely do see. If you are getting more of an ALD more than AST, then think of autoimmune hepatitis, viral hepatitis, A, B, C, medications, toxic histories, think of any uh, fatty infiltration, or even the sometimes the celiacs. So, so in that next case uh, that we first saw, after three days the enzymes went up to thousands. So, just enzymes going to thousands, does it mean the child has gone into liver failure? So, as seen the first column, uh, when we think of the INR is elevated, only then we will think of uh, uh, liver failure. So, other causes where your AST is and then can go in thousands. So, most common is acute viral hepatitis. Then, autoimmune hepatitis. They also think of ischemic hepatitis. Like in a dengue, uh, dengue infection, there is a transient circulatory disturbance. So, you get enzymes in the 10,000, 12,000. They are for liver failure. Then, uh, look for any medications. But the acute blood carriers, you can have very high enzymes. Then, hepatitis. Uh, so, the child has undergone. Some laparoscopic uh, non metal surgeries. You can there can be hepatic artery ligations or injuries. Uh, sometimes even if your AST is more than ALT, sometimes the rhabdomyolysis, some medication and uh, alcohol injury, there it can go. But if you see that there is rapid uh, basically AST LT fall, we have uh, basically classically seen that is recovered from the uh, bad progresses, but it can be an improvement also because the half life is 48 hours. So we are getting a rapid fall along with that. Pay attention to high rising bilirubin and deranged INR, then it's of a poor prognosis. So, always it is a combination of the tests that we see, not only single test generally do not give us enough clinically significant information. Now, uh, the, let's go to second case. Now, the ATS boy, born of Monsignor's marriage, he has a, uh, uh, since six months of age, this child has a pruritus. And there was growth retardation, hepatos, the liver and spleen were palpable. If you do LFT, he has a conjugated hyperbilirubin. Sensitive functions were well preserved. AST, ALT was five times elevated, and if you see GGT, it was almost ten times elevated. If you if you can recollect this pattern, so it goes towards the uh, the this uh, column which is uh, suggests another cholestatic picture. So we have a child with cholestatic uh, involvement. This kind of pictures we do get is closing cholestatic systemic fibrosis or allergy syndrome. So this is the clinical picture of this child where he has a very typical broad forehead, pointed nose, uh, uh, triangular face, uh, pointed chin. There are xanthoma, difficult to recognize in this photo, but there is a, uh, he is because of constant itching, there is a lacrimal condition and this child has a butterfly vertebrae. Uh, so in the pediatric age group, 
just doing ongoing cosmetics may not be uh, useful because the children are growing, adolescent, they have a good bone growth go. So GGT is always important. So always do alkaline phosphatase and GGT. The uh, nomograms for GGT are varied as a uh, at different different ages. So do uh, consider age before interpretation uh, interpreting uh, GGT. Madam, they are also elevated because of medication. So again, the neonate and GGT is very high. And for joint this you are getting a feel of up of any joint. So the GGT can be low very much. So do consider that aspect also when interpreting interpreting a GGT in neonatal cholestasis. Uh, so in pediatric, as we discussed, both the combination of alkaline phosphate and GGT is a must. At least once you order a GGT. Now most of the liver function tests you order, they have not included GGT. So I think with all as a pediatric uh, pediatrician, practicing pediatrician, you should sensitize the labs to include GGT once you order a liver function test. Uh, also look for the biliary system either by ultrasound or the, so once you get a high bilirubin, uh, uh, you should look for a biliary system as well. Now coagulation, very important. Uh, so we uh, test the coagulation by doing the uh, by uh, doing the INR that tells the extrinsic pathway. But apart from uh, this, there are many reasons why uh, liver co uh, in the liver disease coagulation can be abnormal. One is because in the site for synthesis of the coagulation proteins. Along with that, there can be vitamin K deficiency which gets corrected after the treatment. This phenylalanine sometimes enhances uh, fibrinolysis, DIC, and also thrombocytopenia due to hyperfusion. So all these factors can contribute to the coagulopathy that we look into the liver disease. Now, once the enzymes are here, irrespective of what are the enzymes, once we know that there is a liver injury and we know that synthetic function is uh, delayed, what we call it is that we measure it by doing an IR. So IR is more than 1.5, and, and there is an encephalopathy. Then we call it as a Acute uh, liver uh, failure when you know that the disease is less than eight weeks duration. But if your IMR is more than two, then regardless of the encephalopathy, we do consider it as a liver failure because in pediatric age group, seeing the grade one encephalopathy may be clinically will be difficult to uh, identify. Uh, so uh, and it has it does have a prognostic value, and that's why the IMR has been incorporated in many of the uh, prognostic scores. I am not going to uh, go detail in those scores. Uh, so we should monitor INR as a treatment, uh, uh, as a prognostic marker to the injury. But we know that the INR, though it's uh, uh, so in liver disease, what happens? All the co coagulant factors, which are pro and anti, they are disturbed. So INR is disturbed. But in vivo, the coagulation balance may be remain still well uh, maintained. So it is just a disturbed state of balance at another level. So the child still may not bleed even if the INR is prolonged. So we do not treat this INR clinically unless the child is bleeding or the patient or we are planning some invasive procedures like putting arterial line or central uh, catheters or LD catheters. Then only we support. So how do we uh, basically uh, manage this uh, coagulopathy or how we decide? So unless the child is bleeding, we don't provide any kind of uh, uh, blood products. So what do we do? So it may not be available in all centers, but all the centers where I think the good cardiac surgery is done or a liver transplant surgery is done, we have something called as a thromboelastogram or rotum. So with this, it, it, it just basically uh, replicate the in vivo uh, process of coagulation outside the body. So in this, basically a particular graph is generated uh, once the coagulation process of the blood uh, starts and depending on what reading we get, uh, we can supply that particular product. So suppose the R uh, is here, if it's for the clot initiation time, we get this alpha angle that tells about the conversion of fibrillin to fibrin. This MA tells you about the clot strength and then this lysis that it tells about the lysis at the 30 minutes. So depending on which parameters are normal, we can basically supply the blood product. So if your R product is there, we just supply the FFP. If your angle is uh, uh, is a prolonged, we can again use large volume of FFP. Or sometimes when the, even the fibrinogen is helpful, when MA is abnormal, only platelets can be given. Or suppose sometimes it is only lytic uh, 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 lysis uh, time is uh, increased, then one can do the tridazimidazim. So this approach is very useful where you use 
the selective blood products, which a patient doesn't go in a volume expansion, is even more useful for any uh, patients which are probably we see in the ready season. The mass is going to come, so sometimes we give the blood products, but still they are ready because we don't know at what stage the coagulation is disturbed. That is the main problem. So you can select uh, this is something quite useful, and we uh, are using it uh, quite often. So again, uh, all uh, when you are getting a liver abnormality, it may not be liver or it may be something else. So this kind of uh, table will be available in any textbooks. I am not going to debate that, but look for other causes of uh, abnormal test also. Uh, now liver biopsy, it remains the reference standards, but nowadays uh, the, there are a lot of limitations. Even in the previous talk, also sir said, okay, now also with the distance also we are in very limited areas we are using. But definitely, uh, it has some value in diagnosing certain diseases. It's not. I am not going into detail of it. Uh, now there are non-invasive serological markers of fibrosis also. They are divided into direct and indirect. Direct means they tell us about these. You know, like what is the direct uh, marker of the fibrosis uh, process? Clinically, uh, they are not that much useful. What generally we are using are generally indirect markers. So, what are the LFTs we have used? The same uh, LFTs, platelets, and all, and they are combined in different different uh, scores, and they are being uh, used. Uh, the advantage of all uh, these serological markers is it has a very good reproducibility, uh, 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 high applicability. Already we have done the test, uh, but the disadvantages are very non-specific. And the performance is uh, not as good as the other uh, methods about telling us the uh, stages of the fibrosis and uh, cirrhosis. Okay. So, other ways to know the cirrhosis in a patient with the liver disease is basically to have the simple imaging that we do on day to day basis, like ultrasound, CT, and MRI. So, they uh, can tell us about the, the irregularity of the liver, how the portal vein size, how the doctor can tell us about the, how the flow, how are there any collaterals, size of the spleen, and again the presence of ascites. That can definitely tell us about the cirrhosis, but they have also limitations. Sensitivity and specificity is not very high. With CT and MRI, in CT there is a chance, uh, risk of radiation, and MRI there is a chance, uh, there is a risk of, uh, um, their cost is more involved. Now, what uh, is more uh, is like elastography for the liver fibrosis. There are three types of uh, elastography. Uh, one is a transient elastography. They are basically a dedicated machine is required. Then there are few uh, methods we are incorporated into the existing ultrasound machine. If the if they have that particular software, that is a point shear wave elastography and 2D uh, shear wave elastography. So both that means all of them are more or less severe. The transient elastography was an older one and has a very good performance for cirrhosis. And but have a limitation for to detect or uh, have a good performance in ascites and obesity. Uh, and uh, then now uh, we have MR elastography also. So the MRI, there are softwares in the MRI where they can uh, basically tell us about the entire liver. In, uh, in, so in elastography only uh, we get an information only from the small portion of the liver, but in MR elastography we can get about the entire liver and it tells about the uh, uh, fibrosis at the different different areas and even in the aside, patient with ascites and obesity it can be used. Now again, uh, the, uh, now in uh, metros and other places also we have a lot of patients with the <coughs> mash. So uh, estimating fat is also quite uh, uh, important. We are getting in kids also uh, the NASH uh, the related ASPLT involved uh, elevation we are getting. And around 15 or 16 years also we are getting a NASH related early cirrhosis. So NASH is like a uh, uh, non alcoholic steatohepatitis. Is really this epidemic uh, is reaching. So liver fat estimation can be done by ultrasound, can be also done by CT. And also by the MRI. So MRI at the moment gives the best uh, uh, readings for fat. So these are like the different different uh, modalities which are recently available for uh, liver functions. So take home message for liver function test. Uh, this indicates the pattern of liver disease, not the etiology. LFT should be interpreted in the context of a clinical scenario. And once uh, LFT is there, you should always do a follow up and try to uh, and, and do well, at least once to do a complete LFT to see what pattern of the liver disease uh, we are doing. And then, uh, depending on what abnormality is there, 
we can do a serial liver function test. Uh, now, when we are trying to assess the liver fibrosis, the liver biopsy is the standard, but it has uh, significant limitation. So, non-invasive test to assess liver fibrosis, they are like amylastography, which is better than the uh, ultrasound. And also, for fat estimation, now we have a CT and MRI, which can, uh, which do have a good predictable value for fat estimation. with the uh, in, in suspected cases of cholestasis also. Uh, with that, uh, we will move on forward with the uh, next lecture. <coughs> Family having one child, 
So uh, this is very important that we should not miss a single child of any disease. So when the patient comes with the neonatal conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, so what should be my approach? <coughs> so what I will do is: is the baby sick or is the baby is not sick? That we always see that if, if the patient is having infection, sickness, or not. So that division we should be doing on the first part. So first step is to have the conjugated bilirubin more than one milligram per cent. And second is not sick or sick child. So if the child is not sick, then how should I approach? So I should see the urine and stool. What I should be asking to the mother and the father or the, the grandparents that to what color of urine the child is passing, and is that color staining diaper or the clothes? So if that staining diaper or clothes, so it is a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And the next thing you should be doing is the watching the stool color. And when we ask the stool color, always mother because of the first child or the grandfather. Uh, taking care, so mother is not knowing what color of the stool it is. So uh, what I prefer to do is to ask them to take the photograph or keep the stool sample and see yourself what is the color of the stool. Sometimes what happens because of the dark urine, the stool might become yellow. But when you when you see from the inside of the stool, when you see that the stool is usually a pale color, and this is very good test to tell us. Uh, it, it has a very good sensitivity of 70% to 90% to to tell me that the diagnosis is biliary hemorrhage or not. So persistent pale stool in not sick baby, unless proved otherwise it is biliary hemorrhage. So how do I go about after seeing the stool and urine color and the conjugated fraction? So the first test I would advise is the path. after doing the liver function test I will uh, uh, advise the sonography. So while doing sonography, there are two three things we should be asking the radiologist to look for. Unless and until we tell them to look for this, they will just say that the gallbladder is present or absent. But what we are interested in, fasting of four hours, this child should be fasting, given IV fluid because liver disease, you don't want hypoglycemia to occur. And ask them that what is the gallbladder length and the volume on the fasting. And Ask them to repeat that after feeding. That is the gallbladder length and volume is the same or is it decreased? <coughs> so if the gallbladder length is less than 1.5 centimeter, or if the gallbladder is absent, or if the gallbladder is not contracting after giving the feed, so we calculate gallbladder volume and then see that 60 percent volume should be reduced, 60 to 70 percent, and if it is not getting reduced, so this is most probably related. Okay. So with a simple test, we can reach to the diagnosis of biliary hemorrhage. And if the gallbladder is normal, then you rule out other disorders like PFIC or PILPD or allergy. <coughs> and also tell them to see what is the CBD diameter. So if the CBD diameter is more than 7 millimeter, then most likely it is a polydocus. So by the simplistic approach, we are going to diagnose majority of the neonatal cholestasis patient. So if the abnormal CBD of more than 2 mm is considered as to be looked for uh, the progression of the cholelocal cyst or not, but if it is more than 7 mm, it is definitely a cholelocal cyst. So the next test which Dr. Vibor has uh, uh, taught us, doing liver function test, what we are trying to say is do the complete liver function test. So do the bilirubin fraction, do the SGOT, SGBT, do the protein and albumin, do alkaline phosphatase and GGT. It is very, very useful test. If you start doing it, majority of the neonatal cholestasis patients, you will be diagnosing them before entering to some of us for the biopsies or the further uh, investigation. So if the GGT is more than 250, if the gallbladder is less than 1.5 cm, if the stool color is white or pale yellow, we are dealing with biliary atresia. So, this biliary atresia uh, 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 in neonatal cholestasis constitutes around 35% of the cases. So, one in three patient is biliary atresia. But if you do the torch infection, that constitutes only less than 5% of the cases. So, 95% of the time you are 
wasting that money on the torch infection. So it was not there in, in patients of neonatal cholestasis to have a toxoplasma, rubella or uh, other infection. So, so you, you see that not sick baby, pale stool, small or absent bar bladder or ultrasound and GGT is high more than 250. So what next you want to do? So refer to the center where the there is the availability of the biopsy to be done, interpreted properly by the pathologist, followed by paroxysmal angiogram and kasai photo endoscopy. There is a cutoff. Some of the cutoffs are written here. So if the age is less than 90 days, we go ahead with the kasai. But if the age is more than 90 days, with ascites or if the child is already having a lot of fibrosis, then there is no point in doing a kasai photo ultrasound because the chances of failure are very high. So we try to avoid doing the kasai procedure if the child's age is more than 90 days. And that is why it is very important to pick up the cholestasis and do a proper test in the systematic manner in the first visit itself. Let's say if the stool color is pigmented, so what could be the possibilities? So the child is not sick, but there is no pale stool, a pigmented stool or ambiguous stool. So you do the GGT and then you categorize them into the three. High GGT, low GGT and moderately high GGT. This is the not the perfect diagnostic model, but if the high GGT is there, then I am looking at again, is it a biliary atresia? or a positive of biliary like uh, bind up, uh, uh, primary sclerosing <coughs> and alpha nitrogen which is we are rarely seeing in our country. But if it is a normal or low GGT and not sick child, then my differential diagnosis would be the PFIC and bilateral synthetic lipid. This is the second most commonest cause of neonatal cholestasis. So the most common is the biliary atresia and the second most common is the PFIC and your uh, 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 biliary catheter defect. So just by doing this first test, we could we can come conclusively to the possibilities of what this child could be having. Okay. The next scenario, if the child is sick, so then what could be the possibilities? So three day old child coming to you with jaundice, ascites, abdominal distension, and sick child having hypoglycemia, then you have to almost every neonatologist and every NICU care rules out the sepsis and after ruling out sepsis or in, in spite of the sepsis if there is a conjugate infection then we have to rule out the galactosemia which is the commonest presentation in the first few weeks of the life. We do the in, urine NGRS. What is urine NGRS? is non-glucose reducing substance. So it is very easy test. We just have to tell our uh, uh, laboratory how to do it. You just have to collect the urine, dipstick, see that glucose is present or not. If the glucose is absent, then you do the magnetics reagent test to see that non-glucose reagent is present or not. But this test has to be done when the child is on the breastfeeding. But the sick child, we usually stop breastfeeding or keep anger. So might be it comes negative. But the second test which is important is GALT enzyme assay. So that Galliput assay needs to be done before transfusing this baby with the Paxil only. So critical sample needs to be taken in patients of the sick child. What is the other possibility is the herpes simplex virus. So we, we do sometimes HSV where there is a multi-system involvement with an acute sick child with failure, neonatal acute failure. The third possibility is tyrosinemia. Tyrosinemia presents usually after one to two weeks and in first two months, they also present with sick child, with adult distension, hepatosplenomegaly, any hypoglycemia, sepsis like picture. But uh, when, when you see uh, all the tests, you do the alpha protein, it is sky high, 4 lakh, 5 lakh, 6 lakh, and you send for the urine for succinic acetone, and then you rule out the tyrosinemia. Some of the disorders like neonatal hemochromatosis, which was earlier caused, uh, name was the neonatal hemochromatosis, now it's gestational aluminum liver disease, GAL. <coughs> so you do the serum ferritin, if it is very high, then HLH and GAL needs to be ruled out. A urine or blood CME PCR needs to be done in the sick child with the multi-system So if the child is having the respiratory illness with cholestasis, 
or a CNS manifestation with respiratory, with uh, uh, liver involvement, then you do the CME PCR. But in my practice, or uh, uh, majority of uh, we practice as a pediatric gastroenterologist, we rarely see a CME as an isolated cause of ventricular cholesterol. There has to be something else, and plus CME is there <coughs> as a bystander. And uh, really, we have not seen out of 1000, maybe one or two cases which are just CME positive and causing the cholestasis. But usually, if it is multi system involvement or multiple blood transfusion has received in the preterm and then they got a CMV. But if the, even though the CMV is causing the neonatal cholestasis, but by treating the neonatal cholestasis is not going to get cured, the treatment is really to help the other. Manifestation uh, like sensory neural deafness, which will happen to this baby. So we wanted to prevent that sensory neural deafness. That is why we treat CMVs for the uh, uh, with viral cyclovir or viral cyclovir. But really, the disease process is not halted. It is a viral infection. So antiviral therapy sometimes helps. So when you diagnose a neonatal cholestasis, this is the treatment: vitamin A, D, E, K and calcium, phosphorus, magnesium and iron depending on that. But don't forget to treat with the IV vitamin K 5 mg immediately after you diagnose it. When you send the child for the uh, uh, blood testing, for the liver pressure test, while taking the blood sample, you after taking blood sample, you just give 5 mg of vitamin K if the child is more than 2.5 mg kg or if the child is preterm or no weight than 2.5 kg, you can give 2.5 mg of the vitamin K dose. So this is how briefly or in a simplistic manner I would uh, uh, diagnose the patients with your little cholesterol. With this background, we will go to a few cases and then maybe uh, uh, some interactions will happen. So, uh, this was the seven month old boy. Jaundice notice at uh, first vaccination date. Urine was dark yellow, apparently well child. Birth weight was 2.7 kg. Uh, and uh, uh, the weight is now 3.5 kg. No other complaints. And mother says the stools are yellow. So, what could be the possibility? So it is a well baby, not growing well now. So we did the liver function test, which showed up bilirubin of A level. HGUT is 147, HGPT is 152, protein is 5.6, albumin 3, and GGT is 288, and PTINRS 3.5. So definitely it is neonatal cholestasis, a not sick child, well baby, and uh, having a high GGT of 288. I think it is seven weeks child, not seven weeks, seven weeks. So uh, this was the child with umbilical hernia and this was the child. So what could be the possibility now? Yes? Hypothyroidism one. Okay. What what do you want to see? So, Raki, before that step, stool color. So, this child had a stool color of this, and after giving vitamin K, the PTINR became 1.5. <coughs> so, high DGT, well child, pale stool, not sick child, so, most likely it is a biliary agent. So, what further test like sonography? Showed a gallbladder which is small. Next step is liver biopsy followed by peroperative cholangiography. Liver biopsy was shown as a biliary atresia. Peroperative cholangiogram and the size was done. So remember, one in three. So most common cause of peroperative cholestasis is biliary atresia. And the, the steps are very simple. See the stool color. See the child is sick or not sick. Do the GGT and PTIN. Give vitamin K and repeat PTNR if it is abnormal and see that the PTNR is getting corrected or not and once you see this within 24 to 48 hours you will reasonably come to a conclusion that what you are dealing with okay so no fancy tests are needed in the diagnosis <coughs> 
40 days male baby joins with diaper <coughs> staining uh, of the urine and pigmented stool. Progressive abdominal distension day 15 of life. Poor feeding of five days. Antenatally was normal. The previous two children were expired on day of life 85 and 65 because of the liver disease. This was the 3.9 kg was the weight, and this child had a cataract with liver and spleen and ascites. So this child is like not like the previous child. This child is a sick child, and you see the cataract. The diagnosis is clear. It is a galactosemia. <laughs> this is the treatable condition. What we need to do is the take the critical samples for the diagnosis. 3 ml EDTA, 3 ml heparin, and 3 ml of plain bulk needs to be reserved in any patients who are sick child. And this child of PTI was prolonged, then we sent the Gallipoot assay and was poor, started on galactose diet, and this is the condition which can be treated only with the dietary intervention. Nothing is required. The child is doing very well. And this is the child, I think, three or four cases of galactose is are from the solar bullet cell. So, and they are doing quite well. Now the child is five year old, six year old. This was the interesting case. Five month old twins, first boy and second girl, having a jaundice and abdominal distension. Growth wise was normal, firm hepatosplenomegaly. So, these, these are the children. So, both of them having a jaundice. So, the first step is, what is the stool color? Stool color is pigmented. What is the uh, uh, sickness of the child? The, both the children are not sick looking. Okay. And five months they are doing well. But this this history was there. So first sibling died at 10 months of age, second sibling died at uh, uh, three years of age, and both of them had a jaundice. And that time the all test was done, the PTI and a prolonged, the tooth was normal, liver biopsy was done in one child, having for the fibrosis and mitral proliferation. So what could be the possibility? It is repeating in the every child. And the child is not sick. So one of the differential diagnoses is biliary atresia, which is not there, which is not going to repeat. Second differential diagnosis, which is most common is PFS. So how do we see? So this child had a GGT of 73, PTI is 1.27, polystatic child, liver biopsy was done which again showed a portal tract widening and by the proliferation. The other IM workup was negative and then at 7 months this child started having a itchy fluoride. Both of them started having a fluoride. We sent the genetic test, confirmed that, that we did the BSCP staining at that time, which was confirmed that it was a PFIC type 2 and we sent the genetic mutation and which also showed a mutation for the PFIC type 2. What happened to them? A male child died at 2 years of age, the female child underwent the transplant at the end of years of age. Now I, I think it's a four and a half years post transplant, the child is doing well. So four children in a family. So that is why it is called as progressive familiar intrahepatic cholesterol. So usually it is familiar, but first of the case also you should pick up that not sick child, GGT is normal. The child is having just hepatosplenomegaly, the stools are ambiguous and PTI is normal. You suspect PFIC and more or less 90% of the children start itching after 6 months when they get a dexterity. Management options is the same, vitamin E, DK and the management of pruritus you should use the arsodeoxypolic acid. The second line is rifampicin, the third is hundensetron. The fourth is cholestyramine and sometimes opiate and some of the kids can be benefited with the biliary diagnosis and ultimately if they uh, had a bad quality of life because of the pruritus or they decompensate then the liver transplant is come as a uh, uh, <coughs> option. So with this we will have some of the LFT interpretation few cases. So this is the fourth uh, jaundice baby, the six week old, all of them. Baby one has a uh, uh, L1 bilirubin and the conjugated is only 0.2. HGO, DHGPT normal, DHGPT 88, PTIN was not done. So, this is a, either a breast milk jaundice or a gilbert. Okay. Second baby, bilirubin same, but the GGT is 580, alkaline phosphate is 1300, PTIR is normal. The possibility is 
Third child, same Miller Rubin, but your GGT is 17 and not sick child. The diagnosis is four I see. Fourth child, the Miller Rubin is 11, but look at the PTI now. It's 3.5 in spite of the giving vitamin 2. So it is not likely to be a metabolic cause like galactosemia, tyrosinemia, or, or mitobacterial disease. So take home points. The clinical history is must to differentiate between sick and not sick child. Mandatory to know the growth chart. The child is gaining weight or not properly. Looking at the liver and spleen. Looking at the stool color is the most important test. GGT and PTINR should be included in every liver function test at least once when the child present you with a liver disease. Torch infection is very uncommon cause of mineral cholesterol should not be a part of our algorithm and testing. Hypothyroidism commonly presents with indirect hyperglycemia and not as a cholestasis. Maybe in the later part they can have a little bit of cholestasis. Some of the children, if they have the other problems, like because of umbilical hernia, you suspected uh, hypothyroidism, it is uh, uh, worth doing that thyroid function test, but usually they don't present with conjugated daughters. Early diagnosis and management helps in improving outcome of this patient because once you have the diagnosis, you can prognosticate it and maybe some some uh, years down the line, majority of these children without a liver transplant can have a, a good quality of life. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the elaborate and interesting case of case dissertation. Uh, now we have Dr. Mohire, uh, sir, from Parshi. He has uh, come as an observer for uh, MMC. Uh, so I would like to call Dr. Mohire, sir, for his presentation. It should not to be the acting the observer, it's your love for this honor. <laughs> Lecture is by Dr. Sneha Vardhan Pandey, sir. He is a consultant pediatric hepatologist and a specialist and liver transplant physician at Sayadri Super Special Hospital, Pune, KIM Hospital, Pune. He has done his uh, MBBS from KIM's Karat, uh, uh, done DCH from Mumbai and EMP pediatrics from KIM, Pune, and uh, completed his DM uh, pediatric hepatology from New Delhi. He has many uh, papers and, uh, in, uh, on his name in international and uh, national conferences and received many awards at various conferences. So I call upon Dr. Sneha uh, Pandey sir for his next lecture on management of uh, gallstones in children. <coughs> Topic which I believe is the second most common 
OPD patient that we are seeing these days and I think the prevalence is just going on increasing with time because of various reasons. I will be covering my talk on the following headings as we go about the subsequent slides. And what I want to stress upon is as there has been a change, this these figures of the prevalence, especially with respect to the children we are seeing, is increasing more and more as we are moving ahead with life. These figures are actually almost 10 to 20 years old and I believe the other uh, seniors would agree that it is still more than what it is projected in these figures. So in children the prevalence of gallstones is almost in adults it is 10, 10 times more common compared to children. The prevalence goes on increasing with age and it is seen almost 50% times in children reaching their adolescence. It is 10 times more common in obese children. It is higher as much as 40% in children who have an underlying hemolytic anemia. However, out of all the patients that we see, it is only 20 to 30 percent patients who are actually symptomatic with these gallstones and which actually warrant treatment. The reason why I say that the prevalence is going on increasing is firstly because we are doing more and more ultrasounds, especially for basic abdominal pain and other etiologies that we are finding more and more gallstones. There has been a change towards as I may say, the western diets which are very rich in uh, lipids that is increasing the prevalence in gallstones and also as we are getting more aggressive with our treatment modalities with parental nutrition and more and more IV antibiotics, the prevalence of gallstones are increasing. This picture actually I saw in one of the standard textbooks which I felt that illustrates the complications of gallstones very well. So like this, if the gallstone remains in the gallbladder, as in most cases, it remains asymptomatic without any complications. As the stone moves towards the cystic duct, it may intermittently cause obstruction of the cystic duct causing biliary colic like pain. Once it gets impacted, it may cause cholecystitis. Once it gets stuck at the cystic duct, it may cause Mirizi syndrome. Once it starts falling down into the common hepatic duct, it causes more and more symptoms which is I feel is very important in our class of uh, patients when it gets impacted in the common bile duct because, because of a structural anomaly most commonly being the corridocal cyst and once it reaches the apicula, it can cause biliary pancreatitis. Long-standing gallstones can lead to chronic cholecystitis and gallbladder carcinomas which are more commonly in the adults. So classically the teaching that we find is what are the types of gallstones, it can be cholesterol gallstones, it can be pigment gallstones, it could be pure cholesterol, mixed cholesterol, brown pigment, black pigment, all of these are very good in theory but I guess it has no clinical implication as such, you don't treat the type of gallstone that are there most. So coming to some common scenarios that we always have questions about how these how common and how our patients are predisposed to gallstones. A lot of our patients very commonly are on antibiotics or diuretics and we find that these patients develop gallstones especially with ceftriaxone because of which it has got disreputed especially in neonates. Diuretics, cyclosporin and some lipid lowering agents can also predispose to gallstones. We actually call them as pseudolithiasis for the simple reason that most of them resolve as the offending agent is withdrawn. If the patients have underlying renal dysfunction or if the duration of therapy with antibiotics is more than 6 days, especially with ceftriaxone, they have been found to predisposed to formation of gallstones or sludge. Most often they get resolved after you stop the drug within few weeks and very often more often you don't have to stop the therapy of the antibiotics very rarely that it is that you have to actually stop the treatment. As we are moving towards more aggressive neonatal management and more aggressive uh, intestinal rehabilitations, there are patients who are on long standing TPN and these patients are at significantly high risk of developing gallstones, especially those who are on TPN more than 3 weeks of duration 
in a study, we found that almost close to 50 percent, if they are on three months TPM, develop gallstones, and the incidence is more if they have undergone some intestinal resection surgery. These patients, once they stop TPM, it may take as long as six months for these bones to resolve. Now, this group of patients are very commonly presenting with gallstones. They are those with hemolytic anemias and especially those with hereditary spherocytosis. Very often, this may, the hemolytic anemia may actually get diagnosed because of the underlying gallstones and the family is still <coughs> similar gallstones in uh, siblings or in the parents. All hemolytic anemia is predisposed to gallstone formations. The sickle cell disease, many of very often they present with severe abdominal pain. There is always confusion whether it is because of the gallstone or whether it is because of the abdominal crisis that these patients have. And they always have recurrent gallstones with predisposed to into complications very often. Other liver disorders which predispose to formation of lithiasis are structural disorders, though they are not primarily a liver disorders. But cholidocal cysts very often is our patients who have complicated gallstones are very often having structural disorders. Gilbert syndrome, PFIC-like disorders, even Wilson's and cystic fibrosis, all these disorders predispose to gallstone formation. Other predisposing factors like I mentioned are extensive bowel surgeries, severe infections, severe sepsis, malabsorptive states like celiac and Crohn's disease, Patients who are on prolonged fasting or who have rap rapid weight loss or have lifestyle issues are predisposed to gallstone formation. So what are the clinical features? Like I told you, even most of them are otherwise asymptomatic on delayed, on detailed history taking you may find that they might have some symptoms here and there which may not correlate with their gallstone history. The typical pain of right upper quadrant pain or in the epigastrium, severe enough, which is typically lasting for hours, associated with nausea, vomiting and intolerance to food, is actually present in only 30% of the cases. Rest all the patients may not fulfill this criteria but may have some pain. If they have obstructive symptoms like jaundice or alcoholic stools or pruritus, these need to be taken with more importance and the need for asking for history of or diagnosis for complications of cholecystitis, pancreatitis or biliary sepsis which is seen in 10 to 15 percent patients. So when you are trying to diagnose these patients, after correlating it with your clinic, detailed clinical history, you have to do a simple ultrasound which has 95 percent sensitivity to diagnose a complex gallstone. Uh, and also, if they have any other structural abnormality, which may be reasonably picked up well on an ultrasound by a good sonologist, but may very often might be require a CT or an MR. Your biochemical test may not be very significantly abnormal unless there is an obstructive gallstone which has a elevated bilirubin or mildly elevated liver enzymes. In case of pancreatitis, you can get the pancreatic enzymes like amylase elevate, being elevated. The hemolytic workup and the lipid profile will be just helping you to identify if there is any predisposing factor. Coming to the treatment, so asymptomatic gallstones, 80% of them will disappear without any treatment, 20% may progress. Stones which are most likely to resolve without any treatment are small stones which are less than 5 to even 10 mm or if there is a sludge ball which may not warrant treatment. If there is a treatment modality like sepsis, infections, deep pain or offending drugs, they also respond without any significant treatment. However, in infants, because they are, what they have found that in infants, they may not have typical presentation and when they present, they are most severe in presentation with delivery sepsis. If the asymptomatic gallstone are persistent beyond one year, they may warrant actually treatment. And if they are symptomatic, you always have to treat them. And treatment modalities might be either medical or endoscopic <coughs> treatment, eventually having some surgical treatment definitely. So in medical treatment, once they come, especially with cholecystitis, you have to stabilize them, treat them with ongoing infections or any precipitating factors. Try to understand if there is any underlying uh, cause that can is, has caused this problem. Keep them nil by mouth, continue IV fluids, IV analgesics, 
PPIs or antibiotics. Now the role of UDCA is very limited though more often we are starting all of them but it works only in cholesterol stones. It helps to decrease the cholesterol content of the stone and helps to decrease the size of the stones. However, the problem is that um, you have to take these drugs for a very long duration for at least 3 to 6 months and almost 50% of these patients will have recurrence of gallstones even when you stop the drug. So on endoscopy, mostly it is the ERCP. What you do is, the most important part is they help in treating obstructive gallstones. It has diagnostic as well as therapeutic benefit. You put in a scope, side viewing scope, go into the common hepatic, common bile duct, put in a balloon, sweep out all the stones that you can find and you stain to the CBD so that the obstruction is relieved and eventually these patients can be planned for cholecystic trauma. The problem is if the children are less than 10 kgs, the expertise here is not as simple as I have told in the last few seconds. And especially if the children are very small, the ERCB procedure is not possible because we don't have the required necessary gadgets to in these children. So the surgical treatment is definitely cholecystectomy. If you find a, a, a cholecystic cyst, it has to be cyst excision with hepatic jejunostomy. The decision about interval versus emergency cholecystectomy is mainly directed about with the help of your on Kali pediatric surgeon and how stable the patient is when you are deciding this. However, most of the surgeons will like to wait for a couple of days to seven days before opting for an emergency or interval cholecystectomy. Most of the surgeons are doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy even in younger children these days. The benefit is mostly that they have a very shorter duration of hospitalization and recovery post operatively. In patients who have hemolytic anemias, they have to be screened at 5 years of age or earlier if they are having symptoms. If they have gallstones, very often they are undergo cholecystectomy and even uh, preemptively undergo splenectomy. However, if they don't have gallstones, doing a prophylactic cholecystectomy in these patients is not warranted. In patients with single cell disease, however, you may offer them prophylactic cholecystectomy because of the confusion always whether it is symptomatic cholecystitis or whether there is abdominal uh, crisis that these patients are predisposed to. What in patients who are having a symptomatic gallstone? So you keep these patients on gallstone surveillance. You can do their ultrasound every three to six monthly. Explain them the warning signs that if they develop symptoms, they have to come to the hospital more prior to the more urgently. So the last slide is, I guess, the most important slide. If you have gallstones, try to identify what are the predisposing factors in these patients. If they have any structural abnormalities and associated complications, with the help of necessary blood investigations and new imaging studies, if you find that they are just asymptomatic small stones or sludges, you can just keep them on surveillance or can start UDCA. However, in infants who have persistent stones more than one year or if there are any predisposing factors like underlying hemolytic anemias and these patients are predisposed to recurrent gallstone like problems, you can offer them cholecystectomy. In patients who are symptomatic, there is no option. You have to treat them. If they have underlying cholecystitis or other complications, treat them medically, stabilize them. Let them undergo an endoscopic procedure if there are obstructive uh, symptoms. Once stable, maybe around 4 to 6 weeks, the stent is removed and they are offered to the system coming there after. Thank you. Uh, now we're going uh, for the break. And you'll be for 15 minutes because we are running out of time. We'll be back in the fall. I request everyone to be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really wonderful program going on.
Dr. Ashish Vavrekar, Dr. Vibhur, Dr. Vishnu, Dr. Pandey. Uh, thanks to Dr. Kaslewal also. Uh, this year we are hosting Mahayogan at Sholapur. So this is a, a humble appeal for everyone to get actively involved in this conference. We have already appealed on the WhatsApp. Those who want to uh, participate actively in the organizing committee, please give, give their names to Dr. Kundan. Uh, and also get re uh, registered also for the conference with the lowest lab that is 6,000 rupees, uh, 7,000 rupees. Uh, so the, the, the uh, organizing committee member, uh, the charges we have kept uh, is 10,000 rupees. And for students, there are two good workshops. One is the advanced NRP and another is the uh, non-induced ventilation. So people, please get uh, registered with this workshop. Thank you. Thank you. So moving ahead, we'll start with the next lecture on hepatic mimics by Dr. Vivo Borkar. Thank you. So good afternoon everyone and then after the tea break, let's uh, again resume our academic journey. A uh, few more series of uh, lectures that are going to be there next to us. So, uh, now what I'll be talking about is hepatitis mimics. So, if you remember from my first uh, talk on levofunction test, we have discussed about the, how the hepatitis picture presents. So, that was a more ASPAT elevation compared to uh, the other components of the liver function test that goes up. So, when that, uh, when there's a um, significant ASPLT elevation, we call it as a hepatitis. Now, after that, depending on the duration, we call it as an acute hepatitis. So, generally, the, the common uh, hepatitis that most of us who come across the pediatric is an acute viral hepatitis, and uh, these kids do present as majority will have a prodrome that will be around 90% of them has some like, fever, nausea, anorexia, malaise, sometimes. And, if, and many of them will be actually unicteric also. So if you if we happen to do a labs, there will be increasing age length at least pretty high time. So suppose the upper limit is we have just seen around 25 cycles, so there should be more than minimum uh, around uh, 90 or 100. And the duration is less six months. And in India, the commonest etiology for acute viral hepatitis is hepatitis A followed by hepatitis E. So both of these almost constitute around 70 to 80 percent of the cases with hepatitis. Now, how does a typical acute viral hepatitis present? Classical presentation, stage one, prodrome that constitutes like anorexia, fever, pain in the right hypochondrium, vomiting, which is non bilious Then stage two, basically here the jaundice appears and there is a dark during. And at the same time, the fever goes down and there is a movement in the appetite. So, in examination, they have they may be having a tender hepatomegalis, bleed may or may not be present. Remember, presence of small spleen doesn't rule out equipment hepatitis. Here, if you see the amniotrans, uh, AST, AD, and Bilubin, uh, those AST goes up, Bilubin may go up around 20%, not all. Okay, so, uh, significant of them are unicteric hepatitis also. Generally, acute hepatitis, your IMR is going to be a normal. Okay. So, most common etiology is it's a viral etiology. Okay. Now, what are the acute hepatitis mimics? So, the presentation of these patients is just like an acute hepatitis, where there is, a, there is some uh, prodrome, anorexia, pain, vomiting. Uh, that is not eating well, but etiology is other than the, the common garden and hypertrophic virus that is A, E, B, and C. So, what are these cases that we come across? Most common are the infective, like enteric fever, malaria, scrub typhus, leptospirosis, dengue hepatitis. Then we do come across quite often over a drug induced liver uh, injury. So, most common in India's scenario is uh, tuberculosis drugs, valproate, paracetamol. Uh, other anti epileptic uh, medicines, even the anti leukemia medicines, uh, autoimmune hepatitis, the Wilson disease, hemophagocytic lymphocytic syndrome. So, these are the uh, cases that we do come across. So, the question is when do you suspect or expect other uh, infections rather than acute hepatitis? What are the uh, basically clues that tells us probably we should point towards this etiology? What is the persistence of fever? Now, we have seen in the first slide in the 
common enterprise in the IT Once the uh, there is a appearance of the jaundice, fewer diseases. But if you have a case where there is a jaundice and fewer persists, then think of am I dealing something else that can be different etiology or maybe subject complication of a common Second, is there or uh, is there if that has altered sensory, we know that a small proportion of acute liver uh, acute hepatitis can go to the acute liver failure. But when to suspect something uh, else apart from that, if you are getting a persistent organality, in commonly in uh, acute viral hepatitis, there is a liver cell necrosis. So the total mass of the liver shrunken down. So if you if you are seeing this child daily on your clinical rounds, you will see uh, the liver span decreases. Initially it may be palpable, later on it may not be palpable and we are just able to see the span of the profession. So if you are getting a persistent organomegaly despite altered sensorium, you think of am I dealing with something else, then biophysic illness. Associated renal failure, if there is anemia with features of hemolysis, if there is a thrombocytopenia with or without bleeding, think of some other, other etiologies. So, now suppose we have a prodrome where uh, so we have acute hepatitis with a persistent fever with the jaundice. So, the fever persists, there is associated uh, the fever is associated with the chills, uh, myelotransference was not very high, and there may be other systemic uh, manifestation. So, what are the diseases? One is common are malaria, enteric hepatitis, or maybe dealing with any bilial obstruction or uh, calculus for the which can be for some others also. So, diagnostic clue uh, uh, so for the enteric fever, generally, uh, most of them, uh, so in enteric uh, fever or typhoid, almost uh, 5 to 26 percent can have hepatitis. They persist to have a very high grade fever, the child looks toxic, they have relative bradycardia. So, these are all the uh, common symptoms uh, we are aware of. Uh, here, around 60 to 80 percent of the time, hepatomegaly is there, and 20 percent time the splenomegaly is there. So, in enteric fever, then the bilirubin elevation is not very high. AST and elevation is around 3 to 6 times. AST is more elevated than ALD. And here, most important is that if we do an LDH, the ALT and LDH uh, uh, ratio gives us a clue. If it is less than 4, this is an error study uh, that suggests it's more, if it is more than 4, suggests of an enteric. If it is more than 5, then it is suggests of acute viral hepatitis. It's not 100%, but it does give us a clue. There was one study in pediatric where the figures comes to be 9, but it may not be reproducible in all the patients. So, if we see the, uh, you know how to diagnose uh, enteric acute hepatitis, uh, enteric hepatitis, I am not going in that. So, here we had a 6 year girl who continued to have a fever for 7 days and, her, and then she started having a jaundice and yellow color. Her fever persisted, she had, she was toxic by look and liver and spleen was around 3 to 2, uh, 3 centimeter and 2 centimeter. If you see the labs, the cells, despite having the fever, the WBCs are not very high. And the liver function uh, shows that ASP LT were hundreds to 150s. Bilirubin was mildly elevated, that was a conjugated one. Iron was normal and anti LDA because that's from a radical the system. So it was significantly high. And they many times, like here, you know, uh, sometimes the blood cultures and all are not done uh, before uh, giving an oral antibiotic. So make sure if you are having this clue, do the blood cultures uh, before. Starting uh, antibiotic when the child is looking toxic and there's hepatosplenomegaly. So here it was picked up on the blood culture. Okay. Now for malaria, again very important. Nowadays we do not see that much malaria in the uh, Mumbai. Uh, uh, how common it is seen here? Malaria? No, no, no. Okay, I think we are. So that's uh, I think uh, last 10 to 15 years definitely this uh, natural history of the prevalence of malaria is definitely has gone down. So here also the here with the onset of jaundice, the fever persists. There's a hepatomegaly and splenomegaly, and with the severe malaria, uh, severe, uh, we can get an anemia, which uh, is because of hemolysis. Sometimes one can get renal failure, and it may be associated with encephalopathy, DIC, and shock. So the typical clue that for the uh, malarial hepatopathy is basically the bill it is called as hepatopathy, it's not hepatitis. So your ASK and are generally two to three times elevated only, not more than that. And you look for thrombocytopenia. Uh, and some uh, in severe one, of course, there is also the DIC, there is a lactic acidosis, hypoglycemia, all these things can be associated. You see, so there are a lot of systemic uh, features which are involved, which separates them from the acute viral hepatitis. 
Then again, leptospirosis quite uh, uh, we do see in the rainy season less than 10 percent of the leptospirosis do have uh, ASTLT involvement. They have biophysic illness initially of a uh, uh, leptospirotic phase, and later on there is an immune uh, phase where you can, can get a deep shortness, you can get renal failure, thrombocytopenia, even sometimes the meningitis. So the altered sense of can be because of the meningitis. So all altered sense of may not be acute failure. So there is hepatomegaly also. Now here hepatomegaly persists. There is no regression of the liver size when there is a progression of the disease. So again it can be picked up by various tests that all of us know. Uh, now again this is a similar case. Uh, there is a girl with 8, years, uh, eight days of uh, illness and then there is, was the jaundice, there was uh, my edema, uh, liver and spleen were enlarged and if we see her labs, uh, we have done a CPK because there was malaise and some pain also. So CPK was significantly elevated. So this gave us a clue uh, and uh, this uh, her blood culture showed no growth but leptospire IgM was positive. So then she was treated uh, with the standard uh, uh, management. So then again another important uh, hepatitis is because of the dengue hepatitis again very common. Uh, so one aspect is because of a dengue hepatitis where we get the ASTLT enzymes in the elevation of 400, 500. Okay, and the another aspect is where we can get the enzymes in a thousand, uh, like uh, 10,000. Uh, so that is a part of an ischemic hepatitis. So that so many times we do get a call where there is a uh, INR is prolonged enzymes is in the thousands, and there is a dengue fever, and we get a. Uh, uh, basically, uh, reference from most of us for the liver transplant in such kind of case because the enzymes are very high. But but this kind of is <coughs> not a candidate for liver transplant is because of circulatory disturbances. If you in this kind of cases, the ASTLT will start improving after 40 hours. So and just manage as per the standard uh, dengue uh, uh, management. So there are WHO guidelines. I'm not again going into uh, those guidelines. So here we have a similar. A uh, case where there was dengue was positive and then we are in uh, 12,000 and 30,000. Albumin was also low. I have a border like 1.6 and child had some intersensor here. But this child just improved uh, with the uh, proper fluid management and keeping the uh, blood pressures uh, as per the uh, centiles as per the age. Uh, now, uh, there is another case. This is a 2.5 years girl who presented with high grade fever and she went to one of the uh, dispensaries which was by seeing an adult uh, physician and they gave aspirin to this child. So after she, uh, they, this child had an altered sensorium and it was rapidly degrading. She went to some place where there was a respiratory and they incubated resuscitated her and this child has an array of ICD. Uh, this is the lab shows acidosis. This is despite uh, succeeding her from the whatever the decomposition uh, emergency she had. The lactate was persistently high. Uh, bilirubin, if you see, was a mild elevation of bilirubin. Enzyme went to 4000, 6000. So, this were uh, just uh, probably ischemic injury was not there when this LFT was done. And the INR was 4.1, fibrogen red and 10. This has died and asymptomatic uh, hypoglycemia. So, ammonia was high. So we thought, okay, it might be an acute liver failure, but here again the liver was uh, palpable. We did all the work of viral, the hepatotropic viruses were negative, autoimmune, Wilson, these were negative. We did some, in such situation, we do uh, extend a viral panel which look for other uh, viruses like adenoid, BV, COV, HIV1, HIV2, uh, HIV6, Sever, Parvo, they all were negative. Uh, chicken pox just as a comes as a part of the panel, otherwise we don't go and hunt for chicken pox in this cases. So we kept the possibility of race syndrome in this child and we prepared for uh, uh, transplant. But then this child was managed very well uh, with the conservative management. This child required a renal replacement, plasma uh, but gradually her liver uh, function improved and uh, she needed required liver transplant. But unfortunately, this child came uh, in, like, uh, remained with some residual brain damage that was probably due to the respiratory array she had uh, uh, in the first presentation to the hospital. Okay. Now, this is another girl, a six years old girl, uh, so three to four days of history of cold fever, malaise, received antibiotics. This girl was from uh, Apola. So she had a great to encephalopathy uh, and her liver was there, it was soft 3 centimeter palpable. 
and she shared hypoglycemia, she had GTC, everything was uh, corrected, but she uh, continued to have under sensorium despite correcting all the metabolic parameters. And see the LFT, the LFT is there in uh, say, say uh, 500 to 600, albumin was a little bit low, uh, despite being vitamin K, her INR was 3.6, so she was referred to us uh, for a transplant. So our blood gas was, uh, was showing some metabolic uh, acidosis, ammonia was more mildly elevated, not very high, and fibrogen was also low. Again, we did all the standard workup that we do for active liver failure, everything was negative. And uh, like many places, like at the admission, the COVID is not done. For this child, we did a rat uh, test at the admission, which was negative, and then we did a like bad rat after 24 hours, the PCR came, and the PCR for the COVID was positive. And for all the other family members also, the PCR was positive. This child had a curved fever at the onset of the symptom. And uh, you know, her, uh, if you see her GGT, the uh, LFT, the GTs were also quite significantly elevated. And uh, we, we concluded that this might be a COVID-19 related uh, liver failure. Very few cases, but this child spontaneously, uh, uh, without much support, she recovered. Uh, later on, with the help of Kasturba Hospital, we did her variant and it found to be an Omicron variant BA 2.75. So, this child is doing uh, well. So, these are probably few new cases with this uh, endemic, uh, pandemic also we got. Now, another interesting thing, uh, subset is the drug use uh, hepatitis. Uh, so, it, so, many uh, medicines can cause, in India, most common is uh, tuberculosis uh, medicines. So, when we are getting an ASPLT derangement, so we calculate something called as an R factor, where we see how much is the ALT value above the normal and how much is the alkaline phosphatase value above the normal. And we take the ratio. If the ratio is more than 5, we think it is a properly hepatitis. It is the most common presentation. If this ratio is less than 2, it can be cholestatic. And if it is a two to five, what is the mix? So the drug can cause hepatic injury, cholestatic injury, and can be a both. Hepatic injury they present very rapidly with liver failure. Uh, can, they can progress to liver failure if you don't identify and take care of and remove the drug from the regimen. Cholestatic injury they progress slowly, but sometimes they leave permanent damage and they present like a chronic liver disease and the vanishing migraine syndrome. All this can happen. Uh, so, most common is anti-tubercular medicines, uh, that's for the study from the India that showed. Uh, other common thing was anti-convulsant uh, medication and when 40% of this drug induced, they do present like a hypersensitive features where they have a fever, rash, imperopathy, eustrophilia. But good part about this is that most of them have a better prognosis, those who have hypersensitive features. But those are hepatitis uh, 1, with the LED induced, they have around 40% have a mortality. So identifying a uh, medical uh, ATP induced uh, liver injury is very important for prognosis. Uh, so when to stop the drug? When your ASTLT is more than five times normal, the respect of the symptom. When your ASTLT are more than three times with the symptoms, serum uh, like phosphatase, they are going up two times upper uh, limit of normal. And or your bilirubin is more than two times upper limit normal, irrespective of your ASTLT, one should stop the uh, medications. So, how to introduce? Uh, there are different different protocols. Uh, so, one is American thoracic surgery, British thoracic surgery, and there was one study which is done from the India. Now, uh, the ATS protocol says that there is no dose escalation and to introduce the medicines in a uh, sequence of rapamycin followed by ANA followed by uh, paracinamide and monitor the LFT. Uh, British guidelines uh, suggest that you introduce there is a dose escalation and the order is first you uh, you ionize rapamycin and then paracinamide and monitor very closely. <coughs> And then the study was done from, uh, from AIMS and they where they introduced all the drugs together, no dose escalation. And they found that all they have almost similar uh, rate of uh, uh, liver injury and it was around 10%. Uh, so, uh, sir, uh, are you guys following uh, adding all or sequential? <laughs> similar to the ATS. Right? Similar to the ATS. So, we also follow the, uh, the, civil, uh, the sequential because I think yeah, the problem is if suppose there is a relapse, you don't know which drug has caused the problem and then we are basically 
uh, we have to stop both the side of it. All the three side adders will have to stop, and we have then the drawback is the patient will be having a second line drug and will be on a prolonged duration. So here we have a child, 13 years pulmonary TB, four drug episode started, and she has AST LT the thousand millimeter of 5.3, and the AST was stopped. We don't have the what were the values of there is the follow up, but just clinically the iterate went. So the again all the Drugs were introduced without dose escalation in this child, and then this child has again has very severe uh, injury. There the there the bilirubin went well to the 15 and 30. AST ALT is again were elevated, and IMR was also 2.6. So almost for two weeks, and IMR remained prolonged. We stopped the medication. There was no encephalopathy. She didn't require admission, but uh, and she was put on an alternative ATD, and this child improved later on. We have a few cases where this reintroduction has caused a liver failure also and required liver transplant also. So, so be very cautious when we are dealing with ATD in this hepatitis because mortality is very high and it has been found that those patients where actually they are started empirically, they were more likely, more uh, they, that group has more ATD in this hepatitis. So start uh, ATD uh, after molecular, try to start after molecular diagnosis only. Okay, so another child already covered, uh, no, so this is another one, so here this is an 8 years old boy, he has initially a uh, bilirubin of 3 enzymes in 230 and it was managed on OPD basis, when it came to us Adderi, there was a ion of 2.1 and grade 1 encephalopathy, advice that there is a hepatomegaly was there, so here despite iron, I mean, there is a coagulopathy, the iron, uh, the liver was palpable, so that shows us okay. We might be dealing with, may not be with the typical viral hepatitis. Uh, this uh, parents denied admission, uh, but then again, this child after a few days again got admitted with the grade three encephalopathy, and then workup showed that he has a or type two autoimmune disease where ANA was positive and LKM one was positive. So he was very really sick. Uh, he required a lot of stabilization or, and there was no donor, so we have to do an emergency EVO incompatible liver transplant. And uh, this is what, uh, this is what uh, the liver that this child has, uh, cirrhotic liver, and now the child is doing good. Uh, another boy, uh, sir, has already covered this is a disease. So, but the, the message is here initially, there is a, uh, there is a enzyme uh, where increase and bilirubin was also high, but and entire liver functions were not done and only clinically the child was followed that when the jaundice is gone probably the child is well so this is what we have to do in the LFP till, entire, till the normalization of liver function is very important after 6 weeks again this child presented with very high bilirubin, ASTLT, uh, derangement and high now of 3.3 and this child and this child has an IV hemolysis well, the child is encephalopathy and sometimes the IV hemolysis we have or this, this sometimes is very difficult to salvage this kind of patients. So this child also requires CRRT plasma paralysis and followed by this child underway liver transplant. But here we had a six weeks time where suppose this child would have diagnosed over here and started on uh, chelation, this child would have been uh, easily saved. So during a complete LFT, following the child, we Normal until the normalization of liver function test. It is very important. You are getting hepatomegaly at least clinically followed till the liver normalizes. So that's what I think we should do. Uh, so take home messages: acute hepatitis fever, consider infective and treatable causes like enteric malaria, dengue, leptospira, scrub type. Because all are treatable. We cannot afford to miss these cases because if we miss, if we are get delayed, take, we can miss the life can go. Uh, then if you are getting a jaundice, encephalopathy, and fever. Uh, because I uh, think uh, other causes like cerebral maria, enteric encephalopathy, dengue, scrub typhus, because they are all irritable. With hemolysis, consider Wilson disease and autoimmune liver diseases and some severe malaria. Where no etiology, uh, look very carefully for history and try to find out any medications going on because uh, there are lots of times patients do not come with the history, sometimes they see some immunity boosters and all they are normal, sometimes they may not consider it as a part of a medicine per se. So take very careful history for medication. Thank you. Uh, 
because when it is A, ideal positive is when you are diagnosed, this is the when it is A is the cause of uh, hepatitis. Okay. So this is a significant definition. So depends on what method they are using for the IGF testing. Okay. Some of them have the sandwich test, okay. which are used. They are very non-specific. Sometimes they have high ATP of false positive. So if it is the ELISA, then yes. Yeah, this is the functional ELISA. How far is common to get the hepatitis A to go in the liver cell failure? Around. And so we have hectic and anectic. Hectic is the most common. See, if you look at the child, he has an anectic hepatitis. Then, chances of that going into liver failure, provided you know that hepatitis A, are very common. But once you get an ectoric hepatitis, that is around 20 percent of that, and one percent of all, so five percent, maybe around five percent of the ectoric will go to might go to the liver failure. So five percent of the ectoric hepatitis is a significant. Thing. And uh, paracetamol uh, uh, toxicity causing liver cell failure. More common and uh, which uh, antibiotic to be used in the patient with uh, having liver cell failure, like uh, I have more than one point five, and the child is still uh, having high spikes. Which uh, antibiotic should be used? So okay, first question. Uh, paracetamol poisoning not very common because we get in the wrappers where each medicine has to be removed. We don't get in the bottle, but still we do get. Uh, and. And your other other question is which antibiotic? Antibiotic. Antibiotic. The final is one point more than one point five. So still with data also the crossing is the same. So generally when you one point five and final are all other so if you are using what is the whether the etiology is paracetamol poisoning or not? If the etiology is not paracetamol poisoning, then other liver disease the safest is the crossing that we use. So it's not a contraindicated. We are using it in a therapeutic use. Is methylamine acid? The safest is paracetamol. So methylamic acid is a stronger compared to what? So if you see our clinical practice, uh, most of the people are using in separation or in combination because there is a parental anxiety. A little bit that the fever doesn't uh, come down, they will come to our clinic and will ask us to die of trouble. So then we tend to give more than methylamic acid, IBGC plus. So generally, uh, of course, I don't. Treat as much as fever as you people treat, but we try to avoid it. Uh, we try to just give a good doses of paracetamol. Then we give four hourly rather than six hourly. It is still in the therapeutic dose. So the dose will go to the 90 mg per kg per day. It is still hardly this is a liver injury even that dose. And we use a tepid sponge. Now, if you are supposed to be getting a viral fever, where is it associated gastritis? And you get a methylamic acid. So every year we get a good amount of patients with the uh, GIP. They have hematomasis, they have malina, sometimes they have to do endoscopy with ulcers also. So we do see that spectrum also. So given the option, I will not use. So how safe is IV paracetamol? They are equally safe, but the dose you have to around 10 mg per kg or the 15 mg they are safe i think rapidly used it is one of the i think most sought medication for even the uh, pain uh, management post uh, surgical so that's it so but you have to use the iv medication uh, with the iv preparation initially before the launch of the iv there were im so you have to be if you are using that should be safe for uh, the dose escalation was mentioned. And already given was compromised. Why they are mentioning dose escalation? So dose escalation means you suppose your dose is 100 mg for FMPC. They said okay, start 50, see if something is happening or not. Then go to the 100. What is the maximum? But most of these uh, liver injuries are idiosyncratic injuries. They don't have to do anything with the dose. So many guidelines say don't worry about the dose. You use the full dose. But the uh, the discussion is whether to use all together or sequential. We use sequential because so that we know which drug has caused the problem. So while stopping the drug, which by preferences we should stop? We stop all, sir. We should stop all stop. and then go on introducing one by one. One by one. But how much time to wait? You showed us almost yeah. four days a gap. First, no. fifth, and eighth or something. So if you are using full dose. Then weekly you add one, refampicin for my INH or my pyrazinamide. Uh, before starting LFD, have a baseline LFD so that we know how much they have gone up. And then at one month and or two months, we repeat uh, one LFD to see any asymptomatic ASPLT injury. Most common ATT induced hepatitis will be the first three months, but we have seen till eight months also, uh, seven months, eight months also, the ATT induced hepatitis can now come. So, no. Time duration is safe, but maximum use is the first. Sir, 
suppose uh, like uh, by day 15 we introduce pyrazinamide and that time uh, liver injury or some lethargic enzymes are increased then should we wait or should we switch to second so then we stop pyrazinamide and we continue other uh, iron and rifampicin and then for then we replace iron uh, pyrazinamide with the other medicine the amino glycosides the temperature is already going on then cyclosary uh, then we use it do you have any criteria to say, say more than double the baseline of the levels of HGT, HGPT, we should stop or take part or reintroduce something in it? This is the criteria that we follow when to stop the drugs. Yeah, out of all academic uh, seizure drugs, Warpurate is mentioned as most uh, epidotoxic. So, so whether I have seen uh, the, whether we should do repeated uh, so, so generally what they say that avoid less than two years and uh, uh, valproate, carbamazepine, phenytoin, even ethosuximamide we have seen in the review uh, the years. So uh, once you have, once documented normal there is no need of repeating every three months or six months. Uh, many times they have associated some mitochondrial uh, problems with the valproate. Because these drugs are continued for three years, 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 five years. And yeah, three years to five years we do continue, but uh, I may not be able to give the right answer like when to uh, check the AST, ALT in that, but I think once you have documented normal after one month or two months, then there is no need of uh, serial monitoring of that. There is no such recommendation. But once there is injury, do not reintroduce that. That is all. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we move on to the panel discussion on liver transplant. <laughs> I'm not going to go into this, but there is a long history of liver transplant. What we need to really know is that, as most of us know, there are more and more children getting transplanted. Not all of them are from So there will be people from Shola over here and there. And finally, they will come back to you. They will come back to the pediatrician. So pediatrician in consulted with the hepatologist or the hepatology team will have to manage their child till he becomes an adult. And that's why I think it's more important for most people who are dealing with pediatrics and liver diseases, seeing them in the OPDs to just understand a few things about the liver transplant. We're not going to go into the intricacies, we are not going to talk about surgery, but you're going to ask simple questions. <coughs> and I'm going to ask questions one by one to each of the panelists. We can start from left to right. So Let's come first to a very general question. So I divided it into various groups of questions and you will see as we go on. So, let's start with you. What are the commonest indications for a liver transplant, let's say in India? So, the common indication, most common still, biliary atresia remains the most common cause of uh, liver transplant in India. Followed by indications like acute liver failure, followed by decompensated chronic liver disease, metabolic liver disorders, liver tumors, there are. But is there a possibility that you don't want to do a liver transplant, especially for liver disease? So if the patient has, so if it is an acute problem and if the patient has uncontrolled systemic complications like systemic <coughs> sepsis or shock or irreversible other organ disease like neurological disorders, then those patients who don't want to transplant. Or if there is a disease which affects multiple systems, liver being one of them but the other organs are already damaged and the liver transplant isolatedly will not improve the outcome in those conditions you don't want to transplant or if there is lastly the systemic malignancy advanced 
metastasis you don't want to transfer. But are the things changing with time? Some things initially which were thought to be a contraindication are now maybe not so much of a contraindication. Yeah. So sir, like you might, uh, mentioned that neurovilsins. So neurovilsins is I think a very grey zone where patients, people want to transplant them more so to improve their uh, sur more than survival, their quality of life. Similarly, there are metabolic disorders which initially paid people thought that should not be transplanted because especially uh, the mitochondrial disorders where they affect multiple uh, systems. But if the right now people are transplanting these disorders, if liver is the predominant organ that time, understanding that the risk of future sorry, second organ involvement may occur. So obviously requiring a lot of counseling to the yes. family yes. sort of situation. What are the survivals that we know of for the various well, let's talk about the common groups, liver failures, chronic liver diseases of undetermined standard etiologies, biliary atheas and MLDs. Which of all of them has got the best post liver transplant survival? So acute liver failure, I feel sir, are a special group of patients where the survival depends a lot on how they reach the transplant uh, operation theater. So if they have advanced encephalopathy with raised ICT, even with the best of the management, I feel maybe the outcome may vary a little bit. However, all these uh, causes like acute liver failure, CLD, pilary atresia, metabolic disorders more so have a survival uh, of around 85 to 92 percent for both short term and long term. The metabolic liver diseases as per whatever is the recent literature from one of the Indian centers, they have a survival benefit uh, of, in, especially in the short term, they have a little lower survival compared to the other causes. But I don't think so there is any uh, survival difference between all the causes of uh, specific etiology. Right. And also within the each group will also depend how sick they are. Yeah, how sick they are. It's yes. not only the disease, but just broadly speaking, as before we come into more details. Before can I come to you? So in biliary atresia, how many percentage of cases require transplant? So there has been a successful case. Child has become jaundice free. How many percent in general will require transplant sometime in the future? And how long is it likely to take? How we counsel the parent? So once uh, there is a successful kasai, this uh, kasai operation, this we have enough work. Uh, time for a few years for child to grow, to arrange the finances, to see what the donor and other. So once they generally uh, they do well for if, if out of uh, that they can remain disease free for a long period. Then the problem that they come is sometimes the portal hypertension. If you on the portal hypertension, it is very difficult to manage or understand that that becomes irritation. Then some few kids have a recurrent uh, cholangiitis disease even after successful uh, kasai. Then they may need. Then sometimes they can have the growth issues to take care of all the nutrition, despite of persisting. A few uh, children can have a hepatopulmonary syndrome, then even their liver uh, synthetic function is good, they may need. So, uh, so these are the other indications apart from a progressive liver disease where the uh, liver transplant is required. So roughly, if you say in the first uh, uh, first 10 uh, years of life, out of this 50 to 60 percent of them will still require liver transplant and rest of them will require later on at some point of time. So in in the in Indian scenario, majority of them will need a liver transplant at some point. That's why we that's what we counsel them. Series from the Japan, they have some other data because their operating age is quite low. So what is it? Paul, when you are counseling a child with biliary atresia for surgery, at that time you don't know whether it looks successful or not. But even at that time, it is important <coughs> to tell him whether it is successful or not. It's quite likely you are going to require a liver transplant. But if it is successful, it's going to be likely to be much later, right? Yes. Okay. I I think you we all do, but I think you can just talk about it. When will you? Because there is this big discussion, should you be doing a exercise at the borderline age? So in your practice, what do you advise a child comes to a little late for the period of disease? So, child less than two months, uh, definitely Kasai. Child more than three months, or three or three and a half months, definitely Kasai. Two to three months depends on the synthetic function, growth, how hard the liver is, what's happening to the me and all. So this is a gray zone. More than three months, what I said, I think still there will be the, some discussion between all. So, so after three months, the chances of successful kasai are less 10%. So, 
So you may get those 10 persons still who have a successful Kasai, but 90 percent you have will be having the child who has failed Kasai. They will have to have many of them because of a surgical stress dissection at the porta, child having a portal hypertension collateral. Many of them do get decompensation. Third thing, because there is an inadequate biliary drainage, these child are these children are likely to have a more collateral episode. So they may need the transplant a little bit early, maybe seven months or so. So those who are requiring primary uh, kasai, we are able to manage them medically to eight months, nine months or so. So we do get that margin of six weeks in the children at doing the kasai at three months and not doing and going for the there will be still, I think there will be debate on this. So this is what generally we follow. Yeah. Uh, and, and there are studies also which has actually shown uh, this uh, because of uh, late Kasai, they need transplant. So if, but if all children with Kasai require a transplant, why go for Kasai? Why not go for transplant in the two months? So, yeah. so that is, uh, uh, I think, at two to three months of age here, uh, because all the kids uh, sometimes they will not be having uh, finances. Then sometimes they will not be having a donor. Third thing, uh, many a times the mother has a donor, so the first six months we will not accept because you know, immediately there will be the polystasis of the pregnancy, so we let her shed her weight, let the uh, fat mobilize, and we let the child grow uh, because this disease is not going to cause uh, any changes in the world. So we, we do not go directly at that age. Plus, Doing the transplant at very small, very high percent more surgical risk in terms of because the veins, uh, the, the arteries and veins are very small. So that's why uh, at that age we do not get. Now this is a scenario for Indian uh, scenario. In the Western, because they have, mostly they are on a caloric uh, program, they try to control the, their donor pool. So whatever the percent of a successful Kasai uh, are there, so they, they save the liver. So these are the different views by different different countries and recommendations by me. Yeah, thanks Rabur. Vishnu, coming to you. Since you started the thing about category, we always it's the problem that adults seem to get a category, but children for some reason we put them on the list but they never end up getting. Why is that? What is your view for? So there are two issues about it. One is the adult liver is big and the, the children liver is small. So, if we have to do the uh, cadaver uh, from the adult, then that needs to be split. And while splitting, the quality of graft goes down. So, the adult other part will not agree for that splitting of the liver. That is one. Second is the scarcity of pediatric liver donation in, in our ICUs and NICUs and PICUs. So, in spite of the <coughs> child uh, uh, having a brain there, still we are not evaluating, uh, not thinking about the donation from the children. And that I think should change. So every child who is likely brain dead and not infective probably should be advised for the, the donation. And probably after advising 100 children, uh, 100 patients who are unfortunately are dying, so we can have two or three donations. So that scenario will depend on our approach in the PSU area. So that's a big problem that children are just not getting the category thing. And I think it's a thing that all these people are facing. They're trying to fight against the system that more than the system they're trying to make it available for children. But children sometimes require even much more than an adult. So that's we have some way to go. What is the presence for people to understand? What is the present let's talk basically let's say Maharashtra right now. What is the present system of Allocation of an organ once it's available. How does it work? So uh, uh, there are, I think, four zones. So one is Mumbai, one is uh, 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 Pune zone, and one is Nagpur. Uh, so the Aranwar, is uh, zone and Nagpur zone. So there are four zones. So when the <coughs> donation occurs in that zone, so in that zone, whatever the transplant centers are there, they get a priority for the that cadaver to be used and that priority depends on the list of centers which they have. So suppose in Pune we have 13 centers. So there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 centers named. So according to that list the donor, the, the, the hospital will get. So if this time the Ruby hospital gets a donor, so next time whenever there is donor available, so the next hospital like Dinara Kandish hospital will get. 
so next time the donor is available the third number will get so there is no system which is for the patient it is a hospital based system so that is one part of it and the second part of it is that even the hospital based still we are in the era there is no on the uh, disease which is decompensated let's see one one patient is decompensated and he needs a high pain score or a pain score which is a score which is used in the western country but in india we need to find it is the patient available is he going to come is the finances ready is he mentally or uh, ready for the transplant in spite of he is having on the cadaver so there are plenty of uh, uh, hurdles while uh, giving the organ to them and on the top of it so uh, it is based on the blood group so o positive cadaver should give to the o positive the recipient the b positive will give to the b positive a positive will give to the a positive so the blood group match the system in the zone wise and in the zone it is the hospital based system now probably will in next couple of years it might change so it's a complicated system and sometimes i mean it can come to hospital but they may have a list but at that particular time the organ is there no one may be free or available or for whatever reason then what happens it goes to the next hospital next then goes to the next hospital it keeps going down yeah this problem okay and and one uh, thing is that if the child is having acute liver failure then or a hepatoblastoma or hcc then they can be listed as a super urgent list so in the super urgent list what happens is whatever the patient is there in spite of is it adult or pediatric whatever is if the same blood group donor liver is available the first priority goes to the super urgent list and then the the complete complicated patient okay i might be saying you want to go little quickly because i think we are going slow any major differences i know there are many but anything that you would like to point to the audience anything major to be that can be get so one thing is like the size of the organ definitely think that you think is when we are talking about adults about the success rate we talk about 5 year 10 year survival for children we are talking about 20 years 25 years survival major difference is between the requirement of immunosuppression because the adults have more associated comorbidities like ckd diabetes hypertension their immunosuppression is guided for the comorbidities for children we are lucky to have that children need more immunosuppression compared to adults that way okay in any idea in india do we have a registry to say how many adult or pediatric liver transplants are done across so many centers So the national transplant right the the noto that is the national uh, organization for transplantation network they, for india they have a registry which is very freely available on their website so for each year especially they what recently what the head check was they have a registry since last 10 years and the numbers are going up very steeply so i couldn't find a specific pediatric data but what i could find last year they had around 2500 liver transplants out of which only 700 were disease donor to majority again we are only living donors and assuming that a pediatric transplant is around 25 to 30 percent of that so close to we are doing close to 800 to 1000 pediatric transplants so cadaver and also this disease donor not disease donor right so just need to understand that okay we'll skip this let's go to the next question before now the question asked by the parents standard and maybe the bit of has been covered so we'll be very quick doctor you told me transplant what is my survival if i try survival rate can be offered that patient who is first stable this is about the basic topic of the patient we give around the one year survival of 90 higher survival of 85% ehs we give survival of around 80 to 85% of one year survival and for next five years we give the 5% of that and those patient who have a decompensation again this is survival for 80 to 85% at one year post Okay, so get it. What is the cost, doctor? <coughs> cost, uh, I think, uh, with the around ten percent uh, difference here and there, I was uh, like the most of the centers are giving a subsidized packages to the children. The cost is about seventy, sixteen to seventy lakh. Now we have to understand it's not the one time cost. It is a cost. I will try like to divide the costing in the four phases. First phase, pre-transplant evaluation that gets around one lakh. Second phase. Actual transplant, which this patient is admitted, both surgeries of the donor, recipient, ICU stay, hospital stay. That will be around sixteen point five. 
Next phase is the post transplant management for first two years, where immunosuppression is high, very uh, stringent, follow up, lot of medication that costs for around two to two point five lakhs in next two years. <coughs> After that, when the immunosuppression is quite less and uh, follow up is also for the same three months or six months, the cost goes to around two to three thousand per month. So, and that will be a lifelong. So that's very important. So any family willing to do that is a lifelong. Well, God. Will anyone help me? Yeah, so, uh, so this sixteen seventy is the cost to the patient, patient or the packet of hospital and someone will help them. No, so that sixteen point five is the cost of the uh, that is for the hospital uh, bill, uh, and that is uh, that is mostly the in, without complication. If complication is there, then the different cost. Now, when uh, like. For the 90 to 95 percent families, this is not a joke. Have a range of 16.5. So, but for the pediatric good part, is a good of the good amount of the uh, financial aid is available. There are many schemes, and they have many schemes. Which are, there are many trusts which helps. There are a CM funds, PM funds also uh, helps them if your hospital is registered. Then there is a uh, crowd funding is available. And also, the patient can also uh, basically start their campaign on their own. So, so to my our experience, if a family is willing, and they are able to do a long term uh, expenses of two to three thousand per month. Then finances is uh, not the problem. They are able to help them. Uh, there is some of the a few families are able to do a hundred percent financial help also. A few around seventy to eighty percent also. Now, if the family has a kind of uh, basically, uh, uh, some employed in the government, they don't, uh, so definitely their eye will be high, so they don't get help from many of the places. So, part of the government are very new family, so definitely they are only remaining on the crowdfunding. So, then they have a limited, they need some contribution from there. Does anyone help with the long term funding, the immunosuppression? <coughs> so, there are few trusts which are helping in the long term also. So, most of the uh, pharma companies are giving them at 30% less cost. They are helping them with the capital interest level, which is also quite costly. So, that increases the cost. The few uh, tr trusts they are helping for four four to five years, they are helping them with the immunosuppression medication. Which will help from 50% to 100% also for first uh, three to five years. So, yes, there is a good amount of help. That is it. If they are willing, there are people to help. So, the right. So, will is what is it? Yeah. So, I think what the point is money should not be a deterrent. Money can be got. It's the willingness of them to follow everything else. And if money is the only issue there, then they, they can help. Really, it's the we have done a transfer like Risha Pooja, we have done a transfer in the family, you say, other birthdays in the other street, we have done a transfer for Adivasi. So, all this is secure on this pattern. So, we are here. Okay, Vishnu. Now, obviously, the next question is family's donor. So, tell us who can be a donor in the living related scene with the laws and what are the things that you look for in the donor? <laughs> so, uh, First degree relatives can be a donor. Second degree relatives with the government's permission can be a donor. The friends and the known person cannot be a donor at present. And uh, majority of the times because of the emotional attachment by the parent, the parents are usually the donors in majority of the cases, 70 to 80 percent times, which is the mother or the father. The only match which is required is the blood group. And the second thing is sometimes some of the diseases we need to rule out in the mother and father. So if it is an allergy syndrome, which is rather the more dominant, or if there is a mitochondrial pathy, definitely mother should not be a donor. Or there is a, some disorders like urea cycle where CPK deficiency, where the, the parents or the mother cannot be a donor. So barring that, the first degree relatives are there. Uh, sometimes the grandfather and grandmother could be a donor, but the age should be preferably less than 50 years, uh, the BMI should be less than 22 and HLA capping is not required but it is required from the legal point of view to see that these are the biological <coughs> relations are there or not. What is the option if both me and my wife can be a that is a blood group, it's not only A to A or B to B or that sort of Yeah, if it is a uh, universal donor and universal recipient. O positive can donate to any blood group. 
and if the recipient is AB positive, you can receive any blood group. The A positive should go to the A positive or O positive should go to the A positive. So the, uh, it is like a blood group uh, giving BC. RH is not mandatory. And I am measuring of the times now with the uh, uh, experience of all the centers are now more than 20 transplants or 50 transplants now. We are ready for the AB incompatible transplant also. Even the, the blood group matching is not required. But still you prefer it because prefer otherwise there are other issues. Okay. Now let's say father, mother, grandfather, grandparents. No, sorry. But the parents are extremely very keen. What do you, do you have any option today? There are few options which we work out. Uh, one is the cadaver listing which we do. And some of the kids, two or three kids, we got a cadaver. Second is sometimes the extended family members uh, like army or khaki, which is not the blood group related, <coughs> the blood related but they can be taken. Uh, the third is sometimes we do the swap. So what is swap means uh, uh, one family is not having the compatible blood group and the other family is also not having the compatible blood group. Then swap is the, the donor of that family will donate to this recipient and the donor of the child family will do that to the, the other recipient, maybe other dog. So start can be a possibility. That's a lot better. That is a lot better. Okay. Now what is the risk for the donor? How long do I stay in the hospital? When can I rejoin work? Any long term, short term restrictions for me? Yeah, it is like a major surgery. So any major uh, surgery like a uh, resection of the liver or the uh, any uh, uh, check from me or something like that. So the risk is less than 0.01%. So 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 2,000 donor death has been reported, but it is still minuscule. Uh, and the other risk is bleeding and the fine which is 2 to 5% for the donor. Uh, they need to be stayed in the hospital for 5 to 7 days. Initially, any major surgeries we do advise them to pick up weight directly, otherwise they can do all the household work, work and after 3 months they are as good as normal, they can do all the work. Okay. Yes. coming to you quickly. How long my child have to stay in the hospital? I'm assuming it's an uncomplicated course following a transplant. So most uh, in most centers I guess uh, it is between 10 to 14 days that uh, patient uh, usually stays in the hospital. More, uh, more okay. Okay. What are the long term outcomes for my child? I'm saying okay with the transplant or not? Will any of this be an issue? Later? So if a child has outgrown his uh, age for growth spurt, that is post adolescence, whatever is his growth potential is already achieved, so it will not, transplant will not help his growth potential, whatever he has achieved will be achieved. But if the child has undergone early transplants, his growth, the catch up growth would be start with after 6 months to 1 year of the transplant and it will be like a normal child. Except some few cases where, uh, indications where he will not achieve the 100% of their growth potential. Uh, we go on to the recurrence. Just quickly, any diseases where you transplant but can recur? So there are some disorders besides the commonly known hepatitis B, C, which are not very common in uh, children, but logistically yes, they can recur. Tumors can recur. There are specific disorders like PFIC type uh, one which can recur in the uh, patient again. Okay. Medications, we generally know. I think we'll skip this medication. Yeah, this is the question. You are talking about immunosuppression. I have been reading the paper that there has been one child who has stopped immunosuppression and is doing well. Is, will there a time come when the child will be able to stop immunosuppression? So, at present, uh, for, the pain, for the patient and the relatives, we have to tell okay, uh, the immunosuppression is going to be a lifelong. Yeah, there have been uh, attempts where people are trying to stop it. Uh, so, what are those subsets? One, early age, less than one year to two years are getting at a transplant, no rejections at all. And so, this uh, in these patients has been tried, and out of that, also, I think around 30% are successful. So, there is a those patients will need a lot of protocol uh, biopsies, but in that also, 60% will show rejection and they will again want the intersection. So, probably. Uh, People are trying to find out those 30 percent where probably it can be the strong. But for the parents, it is like no. Till now, you have to so that coming. So they have to take immunosuppression as of now. <coughs> <coughs> uh, 
I have also been reading up Google like <laughs> where people are telling me I have a child transplant now, but 15, 20 years down the line, I may, the child may require another transplant because the transplanted liver may no longer be good. Is that necessarily what, what do we understand? Is the transplant, my child is 3 years old, transplant it, will they remain with the transplant till the end of life? So, what we say is a uh, person's life and the graft life. So, because liver has very good regenerative capacity, the graft life is as good, as good as a person's life, provided there are not other <coughs> complications like a complication. So, that is around 5 to 10 percent. But apart from that, if your graft is doing good, there has been no injection, it will uh, persist with the, whatever the remaining uh, life of the uh, patient. So what we say about the life expectancy, not an urban uh, uh, situation <coughs> right now, the 68 to 69 years is the life and other patient, a uh, person, we say after transplant it will be 60 to 62 years, the same will be the uh, draft life, uh, apart from the uh, <coughs> So I don't want to go again for the uh, freedom. So you no. say most likely this will be the transplant that happens to the draft. Last couple of slides. Okay, now for the dietitian's point of view, okay. what are the restrictions for the child? So they transplanted in Mumbai Pune back to Sholapur, see the pediatrician. The pediatrician needs to know what what should they be telling the child in the parents. So the restrictions uh, uh, from in the first three months we don't allow to them to uh, meet the people around and go social. So he must strictly be, be avoid going in the social function and even to the schools also. After three months, if everything is normal, the immune suppression is less, they can attend the schools with the mask on. And uh, after six months, they could be like normal children, where the immune suppression is less. Post one year, they are normal like any other children and doesn't require any restriction from the physical activity, from the social activity, or the school, everything should be the normal. Hmm. Okay. And there is some dietary restriction. In the first three months or six months, when the immunosuppression is very high, so we, we tend to avoid the raw thing. And the, obviously the street food not to get infected. That is the dietary restriction. There are some other vaccines. Yeah. So the, it is very important uh, thing, immunization. So every child of liver should get all live vaccines and all recommended vaccines. So whenever you see a patient of neonatal cholestasis or infantile cholestasis, <coughs> chronic liver disease, you should vaccinate them properly. In spite of the baseline of 2, bilirubin of 30, HGOT, HGOT of any 100. So what I see personally from lot of patients a denied vaccination because the bilirubin is <coughs> so that should not be allowed. So the routine vaccination all should be given and especially uh, the live vaccines like MMR and chickenpox needs to be given and if the child is more than 6 months then the two vaccine needs to be given to all of them. So you think before the transplant? Before the transplant. If the transplant has been done, you say the live vaccines are preferably not to be given, right? Yeah. Post transplant, no live vaccine. Killed vaccine only after one year. Okay. So they were done. So managing common illnesses. Let's talk a very quick question. Child has had a liver transplant, is doing well, let's say one year down the line. And you are here, diarrhea, hopping, pain. Are you worried more than what would be better for any other child? So when the child, uh, there has to be a very good communication between the treatment pediatrician and the transplant team with common illnesses. Once the patient is, especially in the first three months, six months, when the patients are on high immunosuppression, even trivial infections can become very serious. That is the time when you have to communicate very well with the uh, transplant team. Once the immunosuppression goes down after one year, one and a half years, trivial infections are very nearly a problem and they need to be treated like any infected infection. You allergies, skin lesions, unexplained fever. All this I say, uh, for example, if there is a fever for a non transplanted child, the parents will take one or two days and then go to the doctor. What I tell on transplanted is that they should see a nearby patient. Uh, if there is no serious problem, the treatment is just like any other. Patient. 
for example, in the diary or something, the table will go down. So then we have to be considered that we may have to stop one or two projects for further program. So that we do with the publication of the PDF. There may be a higher chances of allergies, uh, so that is a possibility, but it can remain the same. Again, unexpected fever, just treat like any, but yes, some, the other causes in the fever will be one. Is there any uh, biliary uh, stenosis which you have to have? Is there, so is that is a cause, sometimes even the injection can give uh, a fever. So apart from this, just treat them like any uh, other uh, fever. Sometimes there is CMV, EBV, so this can be there. So, so these are a few other uh, problems in the background. Let's finish up one more thing about obviously they go to school. Now uh, there is a contact of measles, chicken pox, COVID in class, a contact is there an approach? Yeah, uh, so uh, for the measles, uh, uh, I think uh, if they are vaccinated, still if the measles contact with the child gets a measles then it should be considered as a high risk and should be given antibiotics. Let's first talk about contact. So first is, please come in contact with the child next to develop measles or chicken pox. So just contact. Transplanted patient doesn't have any of this. So is there any additional thing that you would be worried about want to do to prevent? I think the IV, uh, the chicken pox IVIG was available previously and that needs to be given to every contact uh, whenever you get a chicken pox contact, measles uh, uh, immunoglobulin is not available, but they should be closely watched. And if they develop the measles symptom, then they should be given the antibiotic so that they should not get a secondary infection. And the uh, immunosuppression has to be lowered down because we all know that the measles and chicken pox both can cause us immunosuppression. So at that time, the whatever the immunosuppression is going on should be stopped. And for the chicken pox, if the child develops, then they should be treated as a high risk and for a longer period. For 10 days or 15, 14 days of the cyclovir with the uh, can cyclovir with the uh, uh, proper dosage. And uh, regarding URTI and the idea, I just wanted to mention two things. Azithromycin should be avoided. So those drugs which have an interaction with the tacrolimus, that should be avoided. And the second, any immunosuppression we avoid giving probiotic. So here also we should avoid the probiotic for the diabetes. Okay, so I think I have I finished my question, which I, but I'm sure there will be questions from the audience, so please. My question is that if a child needs liver transplant, you, the mother or father can be lie donor. So that proves that very small amount of liver of you of the donor, lie donor. Why it can't happen with cadaver? So why is it not size? So sir, like sir mentioned, the thing is, if you have a cadaver, the cadaver is brain dead, is in the ICU, he is, might, his age might be more than 60 years, or he might be on vasopressors, prolonged ICU stay, all these things affect his own transaminitis might be a little elevated. All these factors are very well established now that they are not good prognostic factors for splitting the liver. So when you have a big liver, the only way you can fit in that liver till a limit is depends upon the patient size. You cut the liver, the problem is the child will somehow manage with that suboptimal quality of liver. The adults suffer. There is high mortality in the adult counterpart. That's why there is resistance that to put a big liver, split that liver, discard the other liver and just use that small liver. That is ethically not right. It's like wasting a liver. Any other questions? Okay. So I thank the panel. I think this was a good question and answer session. I hope they answered most of the questions they asked questions. And I hope that they have a So I think without wasting time, there is another panel discussion which we have planned. So we will go very quickly and fast if possible. Uh, and I have a case based scenario, so probably uh, uh, the resting faculty, we will have some visual impressions of some of the disorders which we see. So what is metabolic liver disease? What? How do I classify or what are the right presentations? 
and then we will go to the case here in the question answer. So briefly, any metabolic level is means there is a defect in the enzyme which leads to an intermediary metabolic pathway, and that product, the intermediary product, could be a toxic which leads to a presentation of the disease. It could be a just a liver or just a multi-organ disease, and which has a protein manifestation. Like I, I would like to classify into three groups. So group A is some enzyme defect in the liver, and the patient presents only with the liver disease. Okay. So group two is a uh, liver is the enzyme defect in the liver, but it could have an extra hepatic manifestation. And group C is the enzyme defect in the liver and the extra hepatic tissue, and they they present with a uh, uh, either a liver problems or a systemic problem. So what is the example of classical group A, where the defect in the liver and majority times it presents with the liver disease is Wilson. Or glycogen storage disease, or a tyrosinemia, galactosemia, irritable fructosemia. So they they are majorly they present with the liver disease, and the defect is in the liver. What is the example of enzyme defect in liver, but they present with extra hepatic manifestation, like urea cycle defect? They present with encephalopathy, uh, uh, recurrent vomiting, or porphyria. They present with acute abdominal pain, GSD type one. They present with hypoglycemia and related symptoms. Or Tegeler-Nazar syndrome, where they present with the, the, the serious damage. Or a primary hyperoxemia. So defect is in the liver, but the manifestation is extra hepatic. And the third condition is defect in the liver and extra hepatic tissue both. And manifestation could be anything. So these are the diseases like a Alzheimer's acidemia, like methylmalonic acidemia, propylic acidemia, MSUD. We talked about mitochondriopathy. So they present like acutely ill child or a jaundice like a uh, Wilson or they can present with cirrhosis or they just present with hepatomegaly, no other problems or, or just hypoglycemia or they can present with a renal tubular acidosis like Wilson or tyrosine. So we always take history, jaundice, see the consistency of liver, spleen and, <coughs> and plot them on the growth chart. The fortunate part of the metabolic liver disease is the management. So some of the diseases can be just managed with the diet. Like galactosemia, if you diagnose it is a just a rewarding. You just exclude the galactose from the diet and child is absolutely normal. Glycogen storage disease, you just modify the diet and stick to the diet regime, probably they will not have the hypoglycemia and they will have a normal life. <coughs> some of the diseases may get up with the drug treatment and the diet, like Wilson disease. The tyrosinemia. So initially there was no treatment which was available in India. Now the treatment is available. The drug is available. It is cheap, and very few selected may require a liver transplant when they are decomposited at the problem. So with this knowledge, we will go into the case. The first case is for the audience because that uh, we have discussed many uh, two times in the presentation. So 12-year-old boy having a jaundice of three months, progressively increasing. Weight is 25 kg, height is 122, wider is normal, there is a deeply ectopic child, liver 3 cm firm, span of 11 cm, spleen is 7.5 cm. So, what could be the possibility? Is it acute viral hepatitis? Is it a chronic liver disease? Is it a hemolytic disorder? Yes. It could be possible, hemolytic disorder. Is it a uh, drug induced hepatitis? No. So it is looked like a chronic liver disease because of the hepatosplenomegaly and growth getting affected, and we will see that how the child is there. So this is the child. So liver is 2 cm, 3 cm, but the span is 11 and the skin is grossly enlarged. So what would you like to do on the examination? Anything you want, want to see? Eyes. Eyes. What do you see in the eyes? Yes, yes, yes. Cave. So it is a greenish, brownish discoloration around the, the uh, in the in the eye, and which needs to be confirmed by the slate lab examination. By torch examination, we we suspect it, but the confirmation is by the slate lab examination. And if you confirm cave, that gives an additional points 
towards that what should be the decision. Some of the children comes with the dilated brains or the abdomens, some of them have a papa erythema. So these are all the stigma of the chronic liver disease. So this is the hemogram and the liver function test of the child. HB silver counts 3600, platelet 90,000, DCT negative, the bilirubin is high, the HGOT 420, HGPT 140, alkaline phosphate 90, PTIR 2.3. So what could be the inference on this? So we have, on the clinical history we know that there is a chronic liver disease. And hemolytic count is very high, 7 percent. So then there is a hemolysis going on. Wilson, what is the pointer in this liver function test which tells us that it could be Wilson? Alkaline phosphatase. If the alkaline phosphatase is normal or low, that is very strong pointers towards the Wilson. It is not the only thing which we say to on that basis, but when you see the low alkaline phosphatase on the liver function test, you strongly suspect Wilson and when there is a GGT which is very high, then you suspect autoimmune or if you have a gamma globulin which is very high, then you suspect the autoimmune liver disease. These are the certain clues. The sonography showed coarse ecotexture, surface nodularity, splenomegaly and ascites like what Dr. Weaver mentioned on the ultrasound. So we wanted to do the workup for the chronic liver disease, Wilson and Atomy. Quickly from the audience, what Wilson workup you want? What test? Yes. So this child has cellular function of 5, biological KF in positive, 24 hour copper is 250, cutoff is 40, but if anything more than 100 is very significant. Most penis loving challenge, I was just wanted to uh, 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 ask panelists, Dr. Gomerita sir, is there any role of post penis loving challenge or should we do or which cases we should do? So, we have to understand post penis loving challenge is done in those who suspect Wilson disease but their urinary copper is not high. So, when you give the penicillamine, the copper shoots up. If you already have a high copper to start with, you do not require and you should not be doing a post penicillin. Right. So this was 250 anyway. Yes. So there is no need to do it. But if we suspected Wilson, everything else is looking, but if for some reason you didn't copper come 50, 60, and you are it, that's the time to do a post penicillin challenge. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So atomium workup needs to be done and ruled out all the HBS and HCV and modified clinic score uh, Dr. Maharaja sir has spoken and this patient fits into 2, 3, 2 and 1. So everything was positive and started on the uh, chelator. So with this we will come to the case 2 and the, the estimate faculty we will so, what was the outcome? What was the outcome? Child is doing fantastic. Six, seven years now, not getting any transplant and doing well. So this is a seven year old boy having just hepatomegaly was referred for that, having a short stature, weight 30 kg, height 96 cm. So, how do we like to pro uh, proceed, Dr. Slevel? Rule of glycogen storage. Rule of glycogen storage. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, this is the child. I, so, what are the clues, Slevel? Sir, yes, uh, uh, first is anecteric hepatomegaly. Very good. And uh, there is hepatomegaly. Organomegaly is more, uh, in the more prominent feature compared to the directly synthetic dysfunction of the liver. There is, I can see the hepatomegaly is more predominant. I can't see if the spleen is marked. So, with the liver more bigger than the spleen and with the anenteric hepatomegaly, I will keep it open for discussion for a metabolic liver. So, no, there is additional, there is uh, the short stature, the case. Yeah, yeah. So this patient, as Sneha pointed out, when the bilirubin is normal and only HOT, HGPT is are increased and synthetic function like albumin and PTNR is normal, so most likely it is a glycogen storage. So how do you further investigate, uh, Dr. Mupur? How do you confirm? So here probably uh, <coughs> we are taking it looks like a glycogen storage disease, but we have to see what are the other metabolic derailments. So I will do uh, sugar. I'll do the uh, uric acid, LDH, uh, 
CPK because sometimes the muscle is also depending on this kind of the glycogen storage disorder. Being in our work, we should also look at the eco of the heart also. Uh, here we are considering uh, glycogen storage because of other uh, storage disorder that we evaluate for high loop for kidney uh, red spot. You see the AFC, look again and look for the developmental assessment, look for early body height. Sometimes you may not get hypoglycemia. So look for early body hypoglycemia. Go in the history and ask for any irritability, perspiration in the child that is coming So all these things I will retrospectively go and do. We'll also look for the lactic prospect. So look at the biochemical one. So as rightly mentioned, first is the cause of hypoglycemia, so 2.2-24 hour fasting tolerance there. Second is fasting uric acid and lipid profile, liver got biopsy, formalin and alcohol uh, and uh, to do the uh, pass and diastasis sensitivity for the looking into it. So Dr. Mawadek, this is the liver biopsy of this child. So, this is yeah, I mean, I would go sonography also because yeah. that increase of basically a homogeneous set of factor. Yeah. I would go ahead and biopsy before doing a little bit more of the lab work because the result of the lab work, if you talk about the only relevant it is like a strategy. If it's not like a strategy, then the relevant work of me or may not be relevant. Correct. So the diagnosis would be a like a strategy based on what I can see over here, frequency is typical for GT type cells. This is the past. So this is a glycogen storage disease. That's the diagnosis we have made right now. We don't know what type or etc. You can sort of guess by the clinical phenotype, but that's all that you can do. It is important that we not only keep I mean the diagnosis of glycogen storage disease in the older days was main. Now I think in the present genetics everything available, I think it's mandatory to find out what type of glycogen storage disease. Not only will it affect the management will affect the prognosis. I think it's important. Yeah, from the slides, it looks like there is a de branching uh, defect in this. I am not good at branching. Uh, yeah, I think it's the same thing. Yeah, so yeah. 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 We have been labeling it based on the biopsy and the clinical picture and most of our children with glycogen storage is type 3 and this was in the last 20 years. The last 5 years genetics are coming up. We are testing all our old glycogen storage disease. We have been labeling it as GSD 3 and to a surprise, majority, <coughs> not majority, around 50% are turning out to be 6 and 9. Yeah. Yes. So, what are turning out? Six and six type six and, six and six type nine. nine. They are not type three. Oh. Though at that time, based on the biopsy, a little bit of fibrosis, a little bit of this, we used to say it's three. So I think we can no longer depend on what we were doing. We have to be genetic. We have to. Yeah. It's important for the prognosis for the parents. It's very important. Sir, a little bit about the dietary management of glycogen storage disease. What we should be doing? Just yeah, the other directions. The whole in general, the principle is to avoid hypoglycemia. <laughs> To be the symptom because once that present to you with hypoglycemia, you present with early morning seizures, etc. So during the day, you need good feeding. You want to give feeding which basically maintains the sugar for long periods of time. There are various types. Of major problem occurs at night when the child is asleep. So what do you do at that time? So you can give uncooked corn starch, which is to be given. If possible, in the early stages when you child will not take the need to put a nasogastric feeding and then feed them frequently at night. The whole principle being is try to maintain the sugar levels without them developing hypoglycemia because hypoglycemic episode can be fatal in an individual child. And this will of course depend on the type of uh, GSD. If you have the type 1 which is going to present with much more significant heart failure, be much more careful and the parents are being much more careful. Three is sort of intermediate in between and the six and the nine are slightly so they are always been considered as benign, but now we know they are not benign, so that's the reason more and more people are looking at 6 and 9. But the principle of it is will remain the same. And whether it's one or three will also depend on whether you will require a little bit of protein restriction or not. <laughs> so quickly to the next case, one and a half year old boy, abdominal distension, weight 9976, hepatomegaly of 5 centimeter, span of 9 centimeters, screen just palpable, and this was the child. This is possible possibility galactosemia because there is a the protocol of washing and reading of the ribs. Okay, so one and a half year old with abdominal distension, batomegaly only with left lobe, speed just palpable. Okay. 
just to give you a thing, we have not seen these cases before. This presentation yeah, yeah. has not been shared yes. yes. So we are also seeing it for the first time. So, sir, I can see this child has frontal bossing, definite or uh, abdominal distension. Uh, looks probably has some rickets as well. But uh, it is normal, no. So, there is no aversion now. No aversion. Uh, this is the yeah, even the hairline was receding. Yeah. So this is the report, more or like same like first time. Bilirubin is normal, HGOT 133, HGPT 154, Albumin is normal, PTI is normal, Hemograph platelet normal, Hemoglobin is 9.1. So this was the hepatomegaly and a little bit of short station and abdominal distinction. So typical picture like what we are seeing in the first chain, glycosystosis. And that is why Dr. Baudaiter was very keen on doing the biopsy first and then labeling them and then doing the test. So we investigated this child further and the child had a CPK normal, the liver function test normal and we suspected it could be GSD or storage disorder and this was the liver biopsy. Uh, uh, this is steatosis. What is this? So, can you give me a point to what is metabolic difference? I think in half years of metabolic what is in this steatosis. Uh, IRR was normal. So, one of the cases, one of the few where you have this kind of cholesterol, you have a little tyrosine here, but IRR normal has to stay away from it. Then, cholesterol is just only another one. Then, fructose, uh, irritative fructose intolerance. So this is the common one I will keep as a okay. So what we know is fatty liver is not a glycosylate disease and then as Aurekasa was saying that the clinical exon sequence came to our rescue and this child has a homozygous mutation which was a transient infantile hypertrichosis. So so now uh, maybe a 10 years back or 20 years back when we were students that time, that time we were labeling them as a glycosyl disease. We could not able to figure out okay, what is going on to this child. And this was the transient infantile hypertrichosis. We started him on the uh, uh, statin, but unfortunately last 8 months we are following this child and now he is going to the chronicity. Uh, and we thought okay, it is transient infantile hypertrichosis and will not lead to a fibrosis. But to our surprise, this child is also getting fibrosis because of the uh, early misdiagnosis and not treated probably. So, not all hepatomegalies are GSD, that is the message we wanted to give, and the liver biopsy is the clue as a first diagnosis we should be doing and then the problem. So, we have first group, which is the defect in the liver and the manifestation as a liver disease. Now, we will go to a case where the defect in the liver, but the management is the extra hepatic or something different. So, this is the 8 day old child having a lethargy and not accepting fluid since 5th day of life, had a convulsion and shock. <laughs> Investigated in periphery, sepsis was of negative CSF normal. They did the ammonia which was 541 and that is why they transferred to us. And what was the lab that time? Well, the bilirubin was 3.4, the direct is 1.2, PTIR was 2.7, HGT, HGPT 675, 370, CRP was normal, hemogram normal, no bad cell, no sepsis was seen. He was transferred, that time pupils were already dilated, fixed, baby was in gasping respiration, he was resuscitated and managed uh, in the uh, uh, emergency and shifted to the NISU. And this was the history that the, there was a six year old girl which was there, the second boy at third year of life died. The second girl, which also died on third day of life, and there was one abortion, and this was the affected child. So, what could be the possibility? So, without this family history, I would have still thought that it was sepsis that is causing the child to go on the after liver failure. This sort of a history, and possibly that they may have died because of liver issue, I think this is now we are dealing with the metabolic problems. You are dealing with metabolic causes of neonatal failure, acute liver failure in a small child. We'll have to look at the different diagnosis of Yeah. So this is the work of the pretty in the, the setting was 4.7. <coughs> so we will 6.5, HGOT 980 and HGOT 340 and ABJ was shown TH of 7.66, ammonia of 987, the bicarb was 25. And this is before correction. 
Okay, so this was the work up. So, sir, uh, what could be the possibilities? With this. What I can see is hyperlipidemia without any acidosis. I presume there is no ketosis or anything else which is there at this present. So one possibility is try to be well for the first few days and then crashing the urea cycle. This is the classical finding that I would expect on urea cycle. But I will also be careful with ammonia because the child is in acute liver failure. And high ammonia could be also related to that. Liver failure. So I have to look at it from the both Sure. So the clue here was, in spite of the child was in the shop, the child was lame, he never had acidosis. So that, that is from alkalosis side. So we have to keep the possibility of urea cycle defect in this child and needs to collect this critical sample before doing anything. We have collected all this and the report showed uh, urea cycle defect, the uh, dicarboxylic acids were present and uh, ketone bodies were not detected and 3 hydroxyl DCA metabolites were elevated in this child and uh, the, uh, the citronyl levels were very very high. So this child was managed with the peritoneal dialysis and the, from 987 the ammonia came down to 30-45 and again in the second third week this child had a sepsis and unfortunately to that we lost this child. So this is a very severe form of urea cycle defect presenting with a acute liver failure in the liver age group. The another case two year old boy, 7 kg and 74 cm, altered bowel habits he was having and recurrent vomiting and he was joined in. But he was a known case of spastic CP and this was the child. Uh, John like cases, there was soft hepatomegaly, the spastic limbs crisscrossing was there. He was conscious alert, he was not developmentally, uh, the, uh, the uh, intelligent point was, he was not uh, delayed and, and this was a hemogram, the bilirubin was just 1.7, HGOT 147, HGOT 43, the albumin 3.7, PTNR is normal, the, there was a hypoglycemia, there was no ketosis, ABGA showed metabolic alkalosis, there was high ammonia, high lactate and normal value. So this is again a, a different presentation of the poor common disease. Do you want to make a comment? So this child is having increased spasticity with hypoglycemia which is non-ketotic uh, with metabolic alkalosis, high ammonia, high lactate. Looking at a non-ketotic hypoglycemia, I am thinking about fatty acid oxidation defects like you are uh, spasticity and still Anybody wants to make a comment at this juncture? I will just show the numbers. So, absolutely. So, this giant we send the plasma amylase with an urinalytic acid, and plasma amylase will show very high arginine level of 588, and the urinalytic acids were positive. So, this is the patient of arginemia which can present like a spastic CP. Okay, so liver is involved, but the, the, the manifestation is extra -abitude. And these are the certain cases, and the, this was uh, confirmed on the uh, clinical exam also. So, started on with a powder and he is with the following with the metabolic consultant in Mumbai. So, let's keep this. This is the uh, URC A powder which is made by the Pristine company in the Bangalore and this is a specific uh, arginine free powder and then you restrict the protein and then you need to supplement some of the uh, uh, oh, uh, arginine needs to be supplemented uh, with this powder. So arginine free powder and then you according to the levels you need to supplement the arginine. So next case I will just skip. Uh, this is one year, nine month old child presented with fever of high grade, blood in vomitus, increased breathing rates, lethargy, vitals were normal, saturation normal, but she was tachycardic and tachypneic, and uh, respiratory system severe is normal, and she was having a mild hepatomegaly. Serious why she was drowsy, and she was referred because the bilirubin was 3.2, HGBT was 74, HGBT was 2.45. The INR of 1.42 and the albumin was 4.9. The hemogram, the renal function test, when everything was normal and only uric acid was high, 19.16. <laughs> then we did the further work of metabolic. The blood sugar was 30 in the lab and then 52. 
the normal insulin cortisol levels corresponding the lactates were high thyroids were normal the abg showed severe acidosis of 6.8 by micro of 8 high nm gap metabolic acidosis little bit of ammonia raised with high uric acid and high triglyceride of 1300 and high lactate so and this child also had a hypoglycemia on day 2 and thought to be a secondary to maternal gestational diabetes mellitus and she also had a similar episode one month prior with the richy food she ingested so we had kept a duty of type 1 gsd fructose metabolism of fatty acid mitochondria and sepsis so anything we were on the stress sorry so this child had a hypoglycemia uh, presented every time when the child was having fever with high lactate high uric acid metabolic acidosis little bit of ammonia raised and little bit lft derangement and ptir of 1.40 and I, I, i am sure that because of the less time i am going fast but in this figure there some significant history of the lactate levels yeah leachy fruit was there one month time but uh, 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 i had one episode of hypoglycemia on day two. So, the uric acid is very disproportionately high lactate. Disproportionately high lactate and uric acid. So, we we also suspected this GSD fructose metabolism defect. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and then replacement is now available, making available not not yet. So once the, this enzyme gets available, then this patient might not be anything else, but this child uh, decomposited and this is from Sulaku only. I think I have seen it, this was three years back and uh, one year later this child uh, 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 expired because of some liver related complication. They, he was not following but when I called him then they said okay the child is no more. So the MLD is a very fascinating group of disorders which needs detective like approach and many a times only thing which will come to your rescue is the critical samples. So whenever you think it is a metabolic liver disease, whenever you see the hypoglycemia, before treating, take the critical samples, 3 ml, 3 ml, 3 ml, play and 15 ml of urine. And once you stabilize child, you can send the reports at any point of later point of view. These are having a different etiology. Neurons will have a different diseases. Infants will have different, toddlers will have different, and older children will have a different, like Dr. Baudet also says. Say, less than three years, they rarely diagnose Wilson. We see Wilson after three years. Majority of metabolic diseases are nowadays treatable with the pharmacotherapy and the special dietary intervention. Very selected few needs liver transplant. And the, you heard about the outcome of liver transplant, an excellent in metabolic disorder. This child two and a half years back diagnosed as a tyrosinemia. That time the medicine was not available under the transplant. Just yesterday he came for the follow-up and I took the picture. So the majority of the diseases which we were doing the transplant now are not getting transplant rate because the availability of the medicine is there. So last two times we have been never transplanted. We started with the medicine which is now available with the uh, Indian company, the, the two more companies in the India. So getting a diagnosis of metabolic liver disease is really rewarding in some of the cases. And thank you, thank you very much. Any questions we can take to the lunch or any questions without suspecting how we are without suspecting how we are and focus and focus in lambda efficiency and so this same clinical exam I thought we could do organic acid but I was not able to uh, think about the liver derangement and the PTI and the derangement in that time. So I thought organic acid was or fatty acid or HMR but Instead of eliminating the fructose, it was the fructose 1-6 bypass deficiency. When we suspect, second question is that when we suspect metabolic liver disorder, then the other thing is that we send directly the genetic One thing is that sending genetics, many a times it takes one and a half months. So till that time you are clueless. What you are sending, this, the test, we were discussing about it. Many times the genetic will give you some mutation. And if that mutation is significant in that child or not. So the phenotype and genotype correlation is very, very important. And I think that majority of these cases which are presented, few of them are, I was clueless. The, the investigation has given me the answer. For me, easy to present here. But at that time, I didn't have any view. So phenotype to genotype correlation is very important. It is not like sending the sample. What, as a pediatric pathologist or gastroenterologist, I would prefer. Before sending the medical sample, I would prefer some geneticist or a metabolic consultant to see. And then they have the plan that we probably these are the one, two, three, four differential diagnosis. And then we wait for the reports to come. Without a differential diagnosis, just by sending the genetic, will not serve the purpose. And our medicine is clinical medicine. Is clinically, we have to have some differential diagnosis. And then only send the test. That is what I prefer. Many times I have failed. 30 40 percent times metabolic liver disease, we fail to understand what is going on. So there is this critical samples and the test will give one plus one plus one answers. And ultimately, few of the cases we diagnose what what it is. So what is the view of other people about the uh, uh, metabolic? Every time I, I may not be sure about the metabolic cause. But it is always non-invasive things. Any pediatrician can go for it. Yeah, but even when you get the report, you realize that you send more and more genetics, more and more confusing it. Yeah. It's a different ball game altogether. You see.
Very simple to make something which is definitely pathogenic. The majority of the time you get a mutation and they will say likely pathogenic, uncertain significant. Where are you? Non-pathogenic mutation. Go to the clinical, go ahead with the standard workup, then try to put together and try to get it back. Ms. Olapur Academy of Pediatrics, thank Dr. Kastival sir for being here throughout and encouraging for conducting CME. It was a great pleasure listening to listening to great stalwarts in pediatric hepatology on the occasion of late Dr. Sir Kastival Memorial CME. It was a great panel discussion as well. Many interactions happened. We Solapur Academy of uh, Pediatrics sincerely thank Dr. Ashish Baudekar sir, Dr. Vishnu Brother sir, Dr. Borkar sir and Dr. Snehavadan Pandey sir. We are grateful and sincerely thank Dr. Arakal sir and Markande Rupnale staff for uh, giving us a hall for the CME. We also thank Dr. Prashant Moire sir for coming from Parshi and remaining throughout uh, the CME as MMC observer. Being a proud uh, Solapur Academy of Pediatric member, uh, he also refused to take the observer. Um, uh, we also like to thank MSN Parma. Uh, we final, finally, but most importantly, uh, we also thank the audience who have come all the way from Barshi, Usmanabad, and other uh, nearby places and from Solapur and attended the CME. Without your uh, presence, a successful uh, conduction of the CME would not have been possible. We had almost uh, 100 registration for this CME. Uh, finally, let's pay uh, homage to Dr. Sharad Kastriwal sir again and conclude this CME. Sure. Yeah, uh, delicious food is uh, awaiting you all.